being said, let's get into the bulk of this interview. I'm going to go ahead and unmute so he can hear me. I'm going to go ahead and pop him up onto the screen. So as you can see, we have Fort Atlantic or uh, John, if I'm remembering right. Yes, John from Fort Atlantic. Because there's actually more people in the band, but you are definitely the one who carries that mantle on Twitch and everything like that. So... Oh, nope, you should be, oh, oh, that's what, I, I forgot to route you out to here. My apologies, there we go, oh, you should good. be gone, my apologies. I all hate to good. make you repeat that, but. <laughs> I just gave the secret to the universe and no one heard it. I know, so. that's my bad, sorry about that. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> but yes, this is John from Fort Atlantic. Uh, you know, I found your stream, I wanna say it was like, what about two, three months ago at this point, four months? And been right, yeah. hanging out every now and again, um, and I was looking up your your discography, and you have a, a pretty good backlog of stuff. And uh, as it says on your Twitch page, you actually have uh, more than a couple of audio syncs with uh, TV shows and stuff like yeah. that, um, which is is really really exciting for me because I feel like, you know. The people who we've had on the stream so far for these interviews have been like. You know, songwriters, producers, people who mostly make dance music. Uh, we start off with Mr. Bill, who mostly makes like a very glitchy, uh, IDME mm. kind of Aphex Twin, Square Pusher style like stuff. Yeah. Um, but he's also done like a movie. Um, so we've been able to kind right. of branch into that a little bit. But this is the first time we actually get to talk about film for or music for sync or music that has mm -hmm. been synced. Um, so to kind of get the people who might not have noticed your stream before because I get a lot of like EDM guys and they don't really follow a lot of the rock guys who right, are, right, it's right. kind of disappointing but hopefully we <laughs> can fix that um, so why don't you give us you know the the Fort Atlantic pitch as it were yeah no so the Fort Atlantic pitch is um, is uh, is a horrible pitch to be perfectly honest if I were pitching to a business a music business person because it's unpredictable and it's whatever I feel like most of the time um, uh, but it, it is always rounded in song grounded in songwriting because um, that's how I started as uh, as a musician I was the dude in the coffee shop playing covers and songs and my songs and tr sleeping in the back of a truck trying to around the southeast where I grew up. Uh, and, and so songwriting has always been my foundation, but as I've gotten older and I've learned more things about music, especially, uh, the EDM world, man, that, that world to me, um, years ago, I remember I was at a festival and someone was talking and Skrillex was, was doing his thing in the background. And I was like, you know, that's the next thing. And they're like, no, man, but not the next thing. I was like, no, that's the next thing this is right when, right before EDM really exploded. Um, and, uh, as a result, I've learned, I, I, I love uh, a lot of the production elements, a lot of the technology, a lot of the things that EDM does, but how does that fit into songwriting? That's generally what it is for me. So whenever I, or my last record, I always explained it as, you know, Tom Petty with synthesizers. Uh, <laughs> you know, did, so yeah. like, <laughs> that's kind of like what I, you know, that kind of stuff is, that, that stuff excites me. Um, and so that's kind of the pitch. It's, it's really uh, taken on more of a explore, exploration thing for me from when I was doing my songwriter stuff. Um, but it's, it's always been still grounded in songs. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the pitch. It's, uh, it's kind of vague, but <laughs> you know, it's starting to de develop even more into different, like to different things, but yeah. Hey, I dig it. I mean, well, that's an artist evolution. Like every, yeah. every artist has their own journey and like, you know, nothing against people who like have their sound and they make their sound and they stick to that sound. But like, you know, it's always interesting to see how an artist's life influences their artwork. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we why don't we talk a little bit about kind of like how you got started with music? You know, um, how you switched from maybe like doing a lot of uh, you know band based work or you know a lot of um, kind of different genres into where you're at now or kind of just the basic kind of the the origin story I guess yeah. as it were no absolutely I grew, so again I grew up in the southeast I grew up just outside of Atlanta um, and there was uh, this the specific club there called Eddie's Attic and it, it's, it's a songwriter's room it's a listening room and um, it's it's one of those places where you go and the dude gets up and he's like hey everyone shut up listen to what we're doing listen to the musicians um, which is intimidating and also really uh, encouraging at times. Um, so when I was in college, 
you know, I'd started, I had my high school bands and uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and then when I was in college, I started writing more of the songwriter world. Um, and I would go down there like, you know, it, like every other, other week to do their open mic. Um, started doing that, started doing that more and more. Uh, and it's actually a cool open mic because it's, it's, it's kind of a competition, but, um, you know, if you win your night, you go to this big one where I played in front of, you know, sold out room and, uh, it was really cool, you know? And so like, that was kind of the origin of me songwriting wise. Um, and, and starting with that, uh, my dad taught me chords on his guitar. Um, and he's, you know, he's like into like, you know, the, the weird old folk stuff, like, and not like the cool stuff, like, like the Peter, Paul and Mary stuff. And so like, sure. he taught me kind of the basics. And then after that, it was, uh, everything went to the side, school, sports, like it was just all music for me. Um, and video games definitely still stayed in there, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So after the whole Eddie's attic songwriter thing, um, I, I just started recording and making music and found this record label in Athens, Georgia, that a friend of mine started and they put out my, the first two kind of John Black records. And they're very, um, very Americana Nashville based. So it's quite different than what I'm doing now. Oh, um, interesting. Okay. Uh, and I was still kind of learning how to navigate that world. Uh, and after that, after those two albums came out, I just was so burned out of, of touring and, um, just living out of, you know, back of my truck. I got married uh, and that was great, but I was also gone a lot. Oh yeah. Uh, and I was just like, this is miserable. My wife was in, my wife's just amazing. I mean, I couldn't do any of this without her. She's a, she's a doctor. She's a badass. She's brilliant. And um, so like she was at the hospital working like crazy and I was on the road. So we were just like missing each other. Yeah. And I just, um, you know, family is a lot to me. So I was just like, I'm done. Like, I'm just going to, pull off for a little while and, and reassess. Um, and that's when I just started uh, really exploring the Brian Eno, use the studio as, a, as an instrument kind of thing. For sure. Um, uh, so yeah, that's when, and that's essentially, I did another full band thing called John Black and the Winter Hearts. And it was, that was the one that picked up with, um, that got the ear of a record label called Dual Tone, uh, who they have the Lumineers and Shovel Some Rope and, Mount Joy and Delta Spirit. And it was, you know, I was, so I was a part of that. They liked it. We worked on some licensing stuff, which is really great. And then um, I signed on to do a record with them. So, yeah. Uh, and after that, the licensing stuff worked out great. Moved out here to Portland. Um, and, you know, I don't have a record deal anymore. <laughs> they were, again, they weren't very excited about the new record. <laughs> It's just fine. Totally. It's just almost like a compliment, but also at the same time, it's like, dang it, now what am I going to do? <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, after that, we moved to Portland. Uh, met our fr my friend Evan, who plays drums in the band now. We met because we were um, someone was trashing Wilco, and we were both like, I like that band a lot. It's funny how the conversations in Portland where you have like, oh, interesting, very pretentious people, and we're like, eh, whatever. I think it's good. <laughs> it's good is good. I don't care what it's it, what it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we started playing. Um, and then uh, in that time, the How I Met Your Mother thing landed, Californication had landed, um, a bunch of other ones had, that, that kept my doors going open for a while and I didn't have to tour. Um, but then when the How I Met Your Mother thing landed, it was, no one was prepared for how big it was. None of us were. I expected oh. it to kind of be just sort of like background music. Um, and so, uh, as a result, I just I started touring again after that. So we did some tours as a band. I did a solo thing with my friends Ivan and Alyosha in Seattle. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So I just you know did that, and then we made a record out on the coast. This last record we made was out on on the Oregon coast in, in our drummer's house he grew up in. So oh, that's it, dope. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's kind of one of those stories that like I don't uh, <laughs> as I'm telling it, I'm like wow, I've lived a pretty interesting, like cool life. You know, sometimes I beat myself up. I'm like, oh, I'm not very interested. I'm an imposter. But yeah. I'm kind well, of, it's like, I'm once you, pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. Once, like, I feel like, and this is something I see from so many artists. We're all so, like, nose deep in our work that mm -hmm. it's so hard to take that step back and actually look at, like, the ascent that we've had right. throughout our careers. Um, 
like, would you say that there's still like a thread back to kind of uh, that old folky kind of bluesy uh, style, like when you first started getting into music, or would you say there's like big radical evolutions in your sound? Um, I th- hmm, I think that I, I think lyrically on the last record, it still is very grounded in that kind of songwriter folky world. Mm-hmm. Musically, it expanded. Uh, considerably because it was a at that point it was a band um and there was us is three of us and it was you know and evan who plays drums he's a great synth player he got me into modular stuff which is back there um and he got me into building my own guitar pedals like he's is one of my best friends for sure but um as far as the songs go i feel like the lyrics have been still grounded in that world and the music expanded and now the new stuff i'm working on it feels like it's kind of the lyrics are halfway catching up with it if that oh. makes any more sense. So it's a little more, yeah. there's there's just richer melodies, in my opinion, than some of the full things that okay. I've, I've done. Uh, well, could you could, could you actually expand on that just a little bit more? Because I'm, I'm curious yeah. how, like, you envision your development as a songwriter as opposed to maybe, like, a performer or a producer. Because, like, I, I'm not a, a songwriter, though I would I would love to be one. Um, and I'm, I'm always curious to see, like, what are the, like, the paths or what are the tools or skills that you've picked up? Like, is it, is it as simple as just, like, I'm more adventurous or I'm more con- confident in, like, my melodic expression or I'm branching out into different styles? Or, or were there, like, m- more kind of defined things that uh, you could delineate from that? Yeah, um, to, to, be, to be as honest as possible, like, the whole How I Met Your Mother thing, um, you are so again when that happened and it was happened in 2012 i think yeah in the 2012 okay, I sure. that's right um and it was that moment where i was like oh my word this is about to happen i'm not prepared for this this is this i'm about to quote unquote make it ever and a lot of people thought that um and then when things kind of went south as far as business and stuff and my, my own mental health went weird um what I learned from there is that um, nothing is guaranteed. Even if you have this massive moment like that I had, um, it doesn't mean you're gonna continue like this, could, that could have been my moment. Oh, so yeah, yeah. instead of worrying about recreating this, um, instead of worrying about having another how I'm a your mother moment, totally. um, after I learned that the hard way that that stuff may or may not have ever happened again, I decided that I wanted to have fun and I wanted to do things that I was interested in okay. uh, and make things that I was interested in. So that, that kind of has really shaped how I create now. Um, and, and in the past I would create for, Oh, this will sound great. And like this kind of scene for, oh, yeah. you know, or this, you know, these lyrics are kind of similar to what's happening in this world right now. And uh, stylistically. And so, and then after that, when everything kind of just fell apart, I was like, none of that really made me gave me joy none of that really gave me like i wasn't very happy because mm-hmm. uh, i wasn't able to express myself um and so after all that stuff happened i realized like the things that give me joy and the things that make me happy and content feel feel content creatively is um exploring just being a wanderer and kind of oh. finding out what i'm doing um and finding my way that so I would say more than like musical influences or anything like life has definitely influenced the way that I create um, in a lot of ways. So that's kind of the big, that's what, that was the big evolution for me was kind of getting my ass kicked. If that makes sense. No, it <laughs> yeah. does. No, actually yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty interesting. Cause like, well, you said a few things there that kind of uh, set off a few bells and whistles on my head. Yeah, like, yeah. Cause you know, listening to your music and listening to your story like the idea or the concept of wanderlust is mm-hmm. an ever present theme and yeah. i like i feel like that is uh something that ties back to kind of what you're saying in terms of the lesson like kind of just living life and experiencing life is one of the greatest teachers as opposed to like trying to uh get some sort of specific technique down, um, if right. I'm understanding correctly. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I and I, you know, I think that's great that there are people who are engineers and mixers um, 
because they serve a wonderful role in the music. But I also, I don't generally speak in tons of musical terms because mm -hmm. the way things that have influenced me haven't always been music. It's always been how something's made me feel, whether it's a piece of music, a, a visual artist, or just, you know, a moment in life. So those, those moments, those things that um, inspire me are way more, uh, yeah, way more life, life than anything. But I don't think it just necessarily has to be like, for songwriting, I think that you can capture emotion with sound as well, and um, capture like this. This is a cool story. This is this thing I'm probably I've shared it maybe before online, but like um, I watched this inter interview with T Bone Burnett, who is this like producer, and I think he's in LA now, but he's done stuff with like Coen Brothers and like all, all, a lot of those sure. movies and stuff. Very folky, yeah, yeah. very. He did um, the the. Uh, Anyway, yeah, he's done some really cool. He was he did the Raising Sands thing with Alison Krauss and Robert Plant oh, for sure. Like really cool stuff um, and interesting stuff. But his he had this interview where he was creating, great, making a record with uh, this folk artist named Gillian Welch, and um, and they put underneath they put all this noise like just gears grinding and things like that just quite quietly underneath. Okay. And he uh, and then he was like, why do I do this? Like he started doing that on a bunch of records. And so he was at a record store and he found a live live recording of a uh, Ike and Tina Turner record that he was at at this venue in Dallas where he, where he grew up. And when he listened to it, he could hear the floor on the ball bearings. He could hear the springs. He could hear underneath. And so he realized at that point he was trying to recreate the motion he had sonically the first time he fell in love with music. Oh. You know, so like that, those kind of things to That's me so poetic. are... Uh, are interesting and I don't think that uh, and, and I'm that comes from a very or, or organic world of music but I don't think that should stay there I think that can easily go into to, to technology and, and oh. electronic stuff you know one one thousand percent like I mean it's it's funny because what you're saying almost kind of ties back to the very first interview that I had and kind of a common thread amongst every interview is almost every artist that I speak to and definitely every artist who I've interviewed has talked about their experiences as mm -hmm. it relates to their music. It's, it's almost never um, a very technical experience. And, and this, this is something that I, I try to uh, remind people as someone who comes from a background of studying music as like a trade craft or as a profession mm -hmm. or as like an academic pursuit. Um, no artist that I know of actually goes into the process with the mindset of I'm going to write music using music theory. I'm going to paint using color theory. It's it's mm -hmm. more like I'm going to do what I experience. I'm going to translate what I feel into my work and all this stuff is just a way to try and explain why we did it. So that right. if we want to show other people so they can kind of ingrain those skills in themselves they can follow that same path mm -hmm. um which is which is really interesting um and it, and it yeah. kind of for me it, it begs the question of like can you exist in a world where and, and this is for you specifically okay. um like where you could make music that is um both for fun for exploration for mm -hmm. wandering um but also for a purpose. Like, could you combine maybe music for sync and music that is just your personal passion? Or right. is there is there some conflict there? There, the the conflict. So the last record, when I when I say it's like Tom Petty with synthesizers, um, I really was going for this like modernized '80s sound. Mm -hmm. um, with a lot of the songwriting, a lot of the synths. I mean, we use the Prophet and the Moog and like just the pads and like Juno stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do was make a soundtrack to that I would have, uh, you know, that I could have seen played in a in a in a movie where a kid's riding his bike to an arcade in the eighties, like because yeah. what I used to do, right, or going to the pool to to you know sneak off with his friends and do you know raise <laughs> hell. But like that, you know, so that was in that sense, like there was kind of a purpose in, in mind with it. Um, it, but it it didn't um, it didn't land in like Stranger Things or any of those worlds. Uh, mm -hmm. But I definitely did create that with more of a, a theme, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I I think that the, the question maybe might be better asked. Like, well, I'm trying to think. Like having uh, exploration and wandering and a purpose. Um, 
and finding even like any kind of commercial success and viability in that world. Yeah. Do those things mix sometimes? Maybe. Um, but uh, I've never had all three of them land at the same time consistently. The How I Met Your Mother was about the big thing, but like, you know, like the that was also a very straight ahead acoustic folky record for me. Um, and so, yeah, so like the new stuff, like that side, you know, I, I don't know if it'll be commercially viable in a sense, but um, I don't care. <laughs> you know, I don't care about that anymore. Yeah, I don't think you uh, should. So, yeah, that, so should. the theme stuff definitely does, you can definitely create like based off of a theme and uh, whether or not it's going to be successful, I think is in your eyes, not any kind of like bank account. You know? Oh yeah. Now I think that's, that's a, a good point. Like if, if we, and, and, and this is something that I think I have fallen into myself um, where like, if we focus so much on what will be uh, approved by the masses or even by like a small mass, like just a niche group, we can end up working on things that we might not want to be making ourselves. And I think it pulls us towards a desire for kind of recognition and gratification over fulfillment. And when yeah. we make something that is personally fulfilling, when we make something that we want to do, that is making us uh, follow whatever passion we have at that time, like the end result will always be better. And mm -hmm. if it's successful, there's a good chance that it's because it was so authentic. Right. Yeah. Authenticity is not something you can really recreate, like formulate. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, Easily. And um, yeah, that's absolutely true. And I, I think that that's the, the, the it's, it's validation is what we want as artists, right? Like we want to be validated. And often we find our validation through, uh, through, the record industry, the music industry, like at least that's from my perspective where I'm coming from. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. oh, well, if you have a manager and an agent and stuff, and then you know you're validated. Um, if you've been on TV, you you know you're validated, and uh, and all that validation necessarily doesn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like you can be validated for a minute, but then all of a sudden, when you you know when those validations go away, because it's the record the music industry, like you know what do you have? And so the the understanding your validation comes from how you. Um, in my opinion, how you love others, you know, like I love my family, how I love mm -hmm. my kid, my my wife, um, and and also that how I love who I am as a, as an artist and a, a quote unquote creator, like making things that I think are um, are interesting, and that that to me shows me validation. You know, I, I'm the one that's validating myself instead of looking for someone else too. Yeah, and that's 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 a really good, uh, in my opinion, at least, it's a really good way to approach uh, just life in general. Um, but like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so kind of talking about what you are working on though, like what is coming up in, let's say the next couple of months, or at least between now and the end of the year, is there anything you might want to talk about? I mean, uh, yeah. as we can see, there's a big old green screen behind you, which <laughs> wasn't there the last time I saw your stream. Yeah. So if you want to talk about that, that'd be cool too, but let's, let's hear what's yeah. going on in your life. So right now we're working on, um, the follow up to the volume two of shadow shaker, which was the, the, the one we just released like two years ago, shadow, shadow shaker volume one. Um, and this one is a continuation of my story, um, of where I was and that, record you hear the wanderlust you hear the searching um and what i didn't realize at the time was that i was uh i was just on the edge of depression a lot i didn't realize that at the time and now in hindsight i realized that um and so volume two is kind of coming out of that cloud for me okay. um there's 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 like sobering thoughts in in coming out of the fog essentially uh, yeah, some yeah. of those are some of them are still very um, are still like, hey, whatever, let it go. Like, let's just go on and enjoy things. Um, so those are the songs that we're working on now. Uh, some of them were actually musically written during the time and recorded during the time we were at the beach, okay. but I didn't know what to do with them. Um, some of them are done here. So those will come out. We'll do, um, we're, we're going to do some shows in uh, Texas in November. Yes, November we'll do Austin and Dallas and then a house show in, in Beaumont. Um, which is like super stripped down. It's kind of back to my roots of a songwriter where it's, uh, it's me and um, 
Evan, who, you know, he's kind of, again, my number two partner in crime. He's, uh, he brings a keyboard and a laptop and he kind of does the Brian Eno, Johnny Greenwood stuff for me, <laughs> for my little Tom Petty folk songs. <laughs> uh, and so we kind of explore that. So we'll do that. And then um, the, the stream, uh, I've been, I've taken a little bit of time off for uh, a few reasons being like my kids started school. That's been a different change in my schedule. My parents oh, were that. in town. And, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and then I wanted to re think the stream what do i want to do with the stream um and i want it to be another extension of of uh creativity pushing me to try new things um and so i've had to dive into max msp and hey, jitter and all that stuff nice. man, to to understand like visuals how i can can i can combine audio and, and visuals and so i've been working with this green screen and um, kind of getting a little bit of a loose idea for what i want it to look like uh and feel like but uh and grow into so that's you know the next thing i'll do is i'll definitely still do where i sing my songs and sing songs but there's a lot more of um the instrumental exploration that i want to do improvised imp yeah, improv kind of essentially online and see what happens that's um, awesome i'm excited to see that honestly yeah. it's it's been really cool to, to 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 really to be like okay i'm hooking up an lfo to a uh an rgb thing that's just the lfo is controlling the colors not you know yeah. not anyone turning the knobs it's really interesting kind of those kind of things make me uh i think they push me create creatively and then and again with the whole like back to that whole thing like editing i think i've told you this before but like when i was learning video stuff after kind of uh burning out again <laughs> on music like to to find another creative medium a creative format um, to learn how to do taught me a lot more about songwriting you know like learning how to edit video taught me to um how to how to uh to write in the sense again how you just capture 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 and then come back to it and then you can like, oh, chisel yeah. away at it and, or you can be like oh, this is garbage and you know you know maybe keep an idea or two so that that's that's kind of the future is what's happening in the next few months. Some touring, um, hoping we're getting so close on this record. I, it's it's all on me now, so it's a lot of oh, no. guitars and, a lot of guitars and vocals. Um, oh, fun! Uh, and yeah, just sort of experimenting with with streaming and what it could be. Um, and again, I, I'm not the guy. I'm always the guy who's I, I'm just never settled. With, I can't be like comfortable that that often. No, I get you. I have to. I have to always be looking at something else and trying something else. And oh yeah. I so mean, I'm curious to see what streaming, what I can do with streaming, just from a personal standpoint. Like, what, what are the boundaries that we haven't, that I haven't found yet? Oh yeah, and everyone, everyone has their own different kind of pathway. Like, because I feel like you and I are very similar in that way, where it's like whenever we feel like we're kind of stuck in any type of rut whether it's big or small, like we look for something that we can like radically shift in our environment. And like for me, it was like literally like, you know, not even a week ago, you could see my kitchen. Now you can see my front door because I completely I moved say, everything around. Places. Like, yeah, it looks like I'm in a completely different world. But like if I if I move my laptop just a little bit, you can kind of see the rest of the apartment yeah. where it used to be. Um, so it's, um, you know, it, it speaks to, I think, again, that, that wanderlust thing where it's just we are always looking for new things to, uh, I don't want to say consume because I think that's too destructive mm. of a word, but to absorb or, or yeah. to assimilate to or to adapt to. Right. I, 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 someone very astutely called me a lifelong learner. And that is, I think a lot of artists are lifelong learners where they want to figure out new things. And it always, in my opinion, somehow always goes back to our favorite art medium that we create. And it's, it's, it's always some sort of ex, like different path to, to learn more about songwriting or production or whatever. So yeah, that kind of stuff is, um, I love this conversation. I love these kind of conversations, <laughs> to be honest. Like, I don't get to have them as much. I'm generally talking with a three-year-old about episodes of Curious George. So, you know? <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I'm with it. Well, I mean, it's, it's I'm kind of, I have a question. This is a little bit of a tangent before we okay. go into kind of like the big main section of this. But uh, kind of because we have kind of a lot of similar ideas about this, you know, lifelong mm -hmm. learners, always trying to find new experiences. How do you feel about puzzles? Do you like puzzles? 
Because yes, that's... adore puzzles. Oh, I so right now uh, it's not in here; it's inside. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know how to do the Rubik's cube, and so I bought one like a couple of months ago, and that's been my. I'm going to learn how to do. I'm not going to look online either. I'm mm-hmm. going to learn how to do this. So the Rubik's cube is one, um, and uh, I see a lot of. I mean, I, just, I see a lot of art as puzzles, finding the right pieces. Oh yeah, to I'm... find or the wrong pieces that look right. You know, <laughs> like, oh yeah. Uh, well... So yeah, so uh, puzzles are my jam. If you ever find me a video game, it's either a puzzle or a platformer, which is a different kind of puzzle. <laughs> it's so funny you say that same here. That's so funny. I mean, it's yeah. like, um, it's 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 actually it's super funny that you called art or music a puzzle because I like I often say music or art is a puzzle where you make the pieces. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it feels like it feels so engaging when I think of it in that way versus when I think of it as like, honestly, like if I think about music as like I'm trying to express myself emotionally rather than I'm trying to solve a puzzle, it's Mm -hmm. it's weird. It's harder for me to get it out because I'm like I'm thinking too much about what I'm feeling rather than kind of letting the feeling kind of flow through this almost like play or exercise that I'm going through. Um, yeah. So I think that's that's just really fun. No, I love puzzles, and it's fun to watch my son, who um, again he's like three and a half, and watch him. Uh, and, and again, there's it's weird when you have a kid because you'll like see the things in them that you're grateful for about yourself, and then you'll see the things where you're like, oh no, oh no, I, mean, oh. I know that I know where that goes. Yeah. Um, but he is uh, he loves puzzles as well. So like we'll sit down and do puzzles. And, Are you gonna and give- he always? He brings me my, he like, he'll find the Rubik's Cube laying around. He's like, dad, you forgot your puzzle. <laughs> I was about to say, are you going to, are you going to get him started on the cube eventually? Yeah, probably. Yeah. He's going to do the, he's going to essentially break the records for the speed awesome. records and then essentially win the world cup for the U S I mean, that's like, yeah, I don't have, I only have small, small aspirations for him. Totally. I'm, that's fair. That's fair. Well, let's, yeah. let's pivot a little bit. Um, but I, I want to come back to this conversation towards the end cause this yeah. has been fun. Um, yeah. so, uh, the main, the main part of this, as I was saying before the stream started, um, is where we kind of go through your songwriting, your production process kind of from start mm-hmm. to finish. And we got two tunes that uh, you pointed me to as far as um, checking this out. We usually start with the completed song. Um, if you have the, the project file, that would be cool to open. Oh, yeah. If not, it's not a big deal. Usually we look through the work in progress more um, because that's the one that you probably have more readily available. But Right, right. Um, um, yeah. I'm trying to get the tune ready. Perfect. Gosh, I don't know if I've looked at any of some of the old for that that one I was telling you about. So, uh, I've completed one. I'm excited about digging into this one. Let's see. Where is it? All right. Well, you're looking. Is it on uh, YouTube as well? Because uh, I want to give people a link to the track. This is a link to the track on Spotify. Yeah, it's on listening. YouTube. Uh, here, let me. Oh, again, if you want to drop the YouTube link. That would be awesome. I'm going to be playing it on stream. Did you want to uh, listen on your end or did you want to just mute for a couple minutes while we listen to the track and then come back in? Um, yeah, I'm actually, I'm fine. I'm fine listening to it. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Here, I'm going to drop this in the chat. Here's the YouTube um, link for the video that, uh, oddly enough, this was one of the videos I learned when I was learning how to do things. Um, <laughs> it was... This is one of the, this is a, again, uh, this is a, 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 a video I made and directed and uh, randomly was like, you know what, I'm going to see if I can get this into film festivals. Hey. How did it was do? accepted into like, you know, like five or six different ones. And That's so I was, I'm, I'm now an award-winning filmmaker too. <laughs> And all that's right. all. That's all a joke to me. Like, you know, cause that means nothing. Oh yeah, it's just <laughs> like, so. A there's name the video the for it. Um, and uh, yeah, and let me see. I know I have a um, a demo of it too. Perfect. Well, uh, did you want to just listen on the stream then? Yes, yeah, that's fine. Totally. All right. Fine. So I'll let him mute, and then we will uh, give this a listen. This is "Bathe in Sunlight."
Out of 
there's the end of it, fading into the next track. That was amazing. That was so fun. Oh, I think you're still muted for a second. Now it's on your end. I there am. we go. Now Perfect. I, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank um, you. I just, there's so many details. I love the mix down on this, too. Like, everything just feels so clean. Like, I love the super, super heavy reverb and delay on, like, your vocals and on the yeah. snare drum. Like, it just, it's so atmospheric. Um, mm -hmm. How did this, how did this get started? So, yeah, this is um, um, one of the songs I'm trying to think. It didn't really evolve too much. This is kind of, I think, in the in the, so in the, the version of, like, how songs evolve. Uh, this one's probably not the best. Because uh, uh, when I wrote this song, it was just me uh, on a piano. And I was very, um, gosh, this, this is a, 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 kind of a longer story. But my um, drummer old drummer from alabama but he was going to move to portland with us and um but he ended up getting his a job at his you know kind of his life his like dream job at this place called the equal justice initiative it's in montgomery alabama and they are um they essentially are fighting for and especially in the south um uh generally african-americans who have been wrongfully incarcerated right and so this this song is about a gentleman named anthony ray hinton who was uh spent over 30 years on death row uh, for something he didn't do. Wow. Um, and, uh, and so when I, you know, as my just, you know, continuing being friends with them, saw that they got him released. And I just remember, I was just like, Oh my gosh, this is like such an amazing story. Nice. Uh, Cause I'd known about it for a while. Cause Josh had been telling me about it. And I just remember thinking like, this is such an amazing story. And, and, and I literally just went straight to my piano and wrote that in about 45 minutes, the, the, the foundation of it. Um, but then I never knew what I wanted to do with it. Uh, I thought about putting out the iPhone demo as the release, sexual release, just because it, it yeah. was very organic and raw. Um, but then one night I, um, I, uh, I have this, this, uh, war, it's called a world war two chaplain's organ, which is these, it's a pump organ that you, you can fold up and carry around. And these chaplains would use these in the, in okay. the war essentially because they'd be going from place to place and they would do a service and uh, they would unfold it and they would play like hymns and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, and so yeah. I'd played one in Nashville and I thought this is one of the cooler things I've ever, I've, you know, I want one of these and it took me years to find one. I found one here. And so one night I just remember I was just sort of playing on the, the pump organ and uh, I recorded it, and then I, accident I accidentally threw it through overdrive. So that first, the organ that you're hearing at the beginning is a very processed pump organ. It's, so it's, 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 it's this mix of organic and digital again. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that once that once that happened, I realized I was like, okay, well, let's see what other kind of electronic elements I can throw into it to make it feel organic. And so um, I don't. You know, yeah, well, let's see. I have a, a, one of the new Roland TR8s drum machines. Mm -hmm. uh, so like that's all 808, um, snare, kick, all that stuff. Oh, cool, cool. Uh, and then the bass is uh, Taurus bass pedals from Moog. Um, this was back when I started really starting to love Moog stuff. So um, they're all Taurus bass pedals. And so I wanted to kind of find this, uh, this medium between electronic and organic and the, also keep in mind this guy is getting released from prison for something he didn't do and in the past 30 years we've gone through incredible digital rev, rev, uh, revolution and the everything you know just kind of crossing over from these two worlds this had to be totally bizarre for him um not as bizarre as being in, wrongfully incarcerated <laughs> obviously but yeah. like, uh you know so that these kind of themes were they started just happening uh and it was like i think i stayed and this is before I had kids. So a kid, it was like, I, I stayed up all night till like 6 a.m. And by the end of it, I had the rough version down. And I was like, this is, this is what it needs to be. Um, so yeah, it, that one really just fell into place. It was really, really fun to watch that, you know, because yeah, the, again, it's a puzzle, right? You may not have all the pieces ready at the whenever you write kind of the idea for the, the overall picture for the puzzle. But mm -hmm. uh, once things start falling in place, you just have no other choice but to chase it. Um, so that was that one was one of my favorite songs that production wise um, on the last record that that and that was all me. That was a hundred. I, I did everything on that one that track for uh, 
down in my basement. <laughs> so cool. That's awesome. I love making music in like non-studio settings. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's what's crazy is like I thought that like the majority of it was just like you know just extremely classic like synthesizers. Like the organ sounded like a synthesizer when I first. It sounds heard like it. it sounds like, like a prophet. Um, I actually we use the prophet for that part now because it sounds like an old like pro, like a, a synthesized transistor organ. Yeah. Like that's kind of filtered out and blown out. You know. So, yeah. It's uh, just, exactly, you're exactly right. It's so it's so cool. I mean, like, I'm curious. Like, did you have any like major hurdles while you were writing the song? Because I mean, you said that like you had trouble figuring out what to do with it. But once you got to that point where you were just kind of like going, like, were there any moments of like frustration, or did it just all just come out naturally? Yeah, no, there was. Um, I I tend to do this a lot with songs where I'll have the song, and then it's and then I have to decide where it wants to go, and so like there are just multiple versions of songs and then trying new things. Mm-hmm. Um, there's an, there's one with, as a band, we're playing it. Um, and it's, you know, I don't know where that demo is. It's probably on someone's phone from our old rehearsal space, you know, but like there's just different versions of it. Cause you kind of were like, where does this fit? And that to me is part of the, the fun of, of making music is finding, again, mm-hmm. it's the puzzle is finding out, out what, where to put things. Um, and when you start to see it fall in place and feel it and hear it, then you, it's like, there's no drug like it, in my opinion. Like you can just, I, mean, I, you, I could just spend 14 hours in the studio in, the, in those moments, like the world falls behind and it's, you know, so those kind of things are, totally. are awesome. But yeah, th- there was a little bit of frustration, but I, I've, I've been doing it long enough to understand, like, just to be a little bit more patient. And, uh, so, and even now, like I'm working on multiple versions of different songs, you know, like. It's a good from, point. Something. So yeah. I'm with that. I mean, uh, so would you say that from a songwriting perspective, the production was like a part of the process? Um, or would you say that they're like the the lyrics and the emotion, everything came first. And then like as you started developing the idea, the production kind of led you almost reactively towards the end result. Yeah, I know definitely the um, the emotion and words and just kind of the the, the song came first, and then um, understanding because I'm a firm believer in in the the music without lyrics and uh, can communicate even uh, you know instrumentals can communicate more than music uh, than lyrics in my mm-hmm. opinion sometimes you know I think they both have just profound places in, in our emotional spectrum. Um, and uh, so, yeah, to, to match those two, to find the, t- the theme musically with the song and to find these two, to marry them, those are the, um, that that to me is, the, that that is worth the kind of frustration of trying different things. Because once you kind of have an idea, okay, well, this is what the song's about and I want this thematically to fit sonically. Uh, finding that right fit sometimes is, you know, cause I could have done it as again, like a super slow kind of a ballad, chill acoustic song very, but it, it's, it's way more triumphant in my opinion that this dude's out of prison, you know, Absolutely. like, so I didn't want to like be a subdued. I'm out of prison. Like I wanted it to feel like, like, you know, like heaven's gates opening up and like, <laughs> there's like a, like a parade for him and like this weird kind of uh, end of the, end of in, in credits rolling moment. Um, so yeah. yeah uh, yeah, so finding the themes between songs, sonically and lyrically, for me is 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 fun. Frustrating at times, for sure. But but when it happens, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, what I what I really was drawn to, especially like I, like I said, like the stereo image was really nice. I love how in kind of the choruses, the the snare drum would come in, and you had that ping pong delay shooting it back and forth. Um, and then uh, how in kind of like the back half of the song or the back third even, you had this almost like Minecrafty, I called it, like the arpeggio that came in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where did that come from? What was so that? That came from the Voyager. Over oh, here. for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> About Voyager. Um, and that idea, um, I, I love, uh, I'm trying to think how to, to phrase this properly. So um, I love watching melodies and notes kind of bounce around a, a specific phrase whether it's um one note and you ha- you know you're having like kind of a drone note and then things are bouncing around it but i wanted to hear what that would feel like as the consistent like the constant in a song where everything else was starting to kind of lose was starting to, to fade into noise um 
And so I just kind of, I, I really, uh, I don't remember if I sequenced that or if I just played, I think I just played it live. Like I was just all day just kind of playing it and just playing it and just over and over and over. And then uh, just to see what it would feel like. And by the end of it, I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, we're just going to fade this, you know? So uh, yeah, that one came from the, that's from the little Voyager um, that I have. Was the yeah. whole, was the whole song uh, recorded in audio? Was there any point where you use like in the box MIDI devices? Ooh. <laughs> oh, I hit, I hit a big one. No, no, it was, no, a- that's a hundred percent audio. Yeah. Those are all like, there's the profit. There's the uh, acoustic guitars. There's vocals. There's the, the, the TR eight. Um, I don't think so. I'm not even sure if I, if I clocked that, the TR eight to the, to the, <laughs> I don't know if I clocked it or not. I think I just like threw it down and went for it. Um, but at least was smart enough to separate the, <laughs> the different end. Um, yeah, so, but um, yeah, no, that was all um, all audio based. Uh, I'm, I really can't think if I did MIDI on that. Do you do any? Do you do a lot with MIDI, or is it kind of just like an afterthought for you? Because it feels like your your stuff is super organic. Like for the thing that really uh, kind of struck me about this track is how live everything felt even though you know there was a lot of uh, processing a lot of right. s- synthesized stuff you could feel the electricity moving through the objects and mm. it has so much of a of a unique character and and i don't hear a lot of things that have that kind of very cold digital sound that you get in a lot of like dance records a lot of edm mm. records um so is it something that you uh, just don't play around with or is it something you try to avoid no uh no absolutely not i think there's i think there's two two philosophies behind midi for me um uh and this i think this is a i think this question may come up later <clears throat> but when i use when i write uh music and lyrics and all that stuff when i'm writing ableton is always open so i'm always sequencing um drums like even if they're organic excuse me organic samples or different, you know, drum samples from there, like the 707. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorites, um, just because it still feels like crappy 80s <laughs> like <laughs> stuff, you know? Like, um, so, yeah, so that's always, definitely drum stuff is always from the beginning sequenced in, 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 the, in the beginning for a lot of things. Um, but there are times where I'm not, I have definitely programmed MIDI to go into like the Voyager or go into the Taurus or the Prophet. So like, I'm not above that because there are things that like, I can't hit this many notes oh, at the same time, but I think sure. it sounds really cool if we can. Um, uh, but I do always try to, even when I'm doing like a soft synth, like I always try to play it live uh, just to kind of see if it can, if it feels like it needs to be, uh, if, it, if it feels or more organic, you know, like even though I'm using electronics, like we're, we are digital and organic people now. So yeah. like try to see those two worlds mix. And, uh, but yeah, it, there's some other stuff on the last record of like some, some uh, more 808 stuff. And um, one of them I know was, was MIDI sequenced, but it's just like a little drum loop underneath. So. Oh, I dig that. Um, yeah. Was So with that, like, were the effects added in post or were they baked into the recordings, like the reverb and the delay and stuff? Right. So um, all of that is definitely, most of that is post. Um, okay, for because sure. Because I, I um, as much as I do appreciate the organicness of making music, I also love the uh, ability to completely shift it digitally um, oh, and, and mess sure. with it that way. So like, yeah. um, so all of it, yeah, generally all the reverb and, and, and stuff is all done in post. Um, maybe maybe I had the big sky hooked up to the profit at that point. But there's, yeah, if it's anything, it would be reverb and some delay. Like those would go through just some guitar pedals and stuff. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But for a lot of the time for for control purposes, I actually do try to do it in post for to at least kind of get a, a handle on things. But when it needs to lose control, like I'll hook it up to a memory man and just let it go. You know, I so. dig that. I mean, I remember, <laughs> well, I remember you uh, you had a, a night on your stream where you were um, playing around with like some, maybe it was like an endless delay pedal or something. Do you remember that? Oh, um, yes. 
Yeah. The, uh, so there's, well, gosh, now I'm trying to remember which one it was. Um, well, while you remember, I'm going to thank yes. Medium Rare Bread yeah. for that raid. Thank you so much, <laughs> Brett. I appreciate it. How's it going? Thank you so much, buddy. I love you. Anyways, uh, so yeah, there's so there's two different kind of endless worlds I, I use with delay. Um, one of them is uh, is the oh, Strymon El Capistan. That's a tape delay. Like mm. essentially, they're they're a, tape, a digital tape delay. They actually have a moment where you can like press on one switch and it just goes and goes and goes and goes and kind of starts feeding back. One. Those yeah. kind of things I think are so much fun to 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 do. Um, I have that. And then I do have like traditional loopers um, that I, I have used. And then there's another one that I use um, and a reverb pedal, a Strymon one that actually I have an expression pedal hooked up to. And it it goes from um, a very like a longer, a long <laughs> reverb to a, an infinite reverb. Oh, uh, so you can adjust so, the time. Yeah, so like I can I can like, and we do that a lot in, when we play live and, and kind of transition in the songs and, and, and build things like that. So like, I do love that infinite stuff. And then I have, I'm even looking at this pedal, like I have this pedal right here, it's like a, the uh, Electro Harmonics Freeze. And it's essentially, you can just like grab a small audio sample and it just, like it kind of drones in. You can just oh, that's like cool. it. But so the infinite delay, there's there's a lot of it and I like to use it. As, as much as possible okay what, well, what and that's that whole at the end of that actually is the delay from the prophet like i just cranked all the feedback up and it started kind of getting that just overblown the, the noise that, so. that's what i was off in the prophet like i yeah. love how you use that to transition into the next song um in the album was that intentional right. or is that just like you had like a big long tail and just to make the two songs feel uh, connected you let it wash over in the album yeah, there was there was definitely um I wanted to, to to feel like I could make. Clearly, I wasn't going to make Dark Side of the Moon, but what I love, but like those kind of records where things just sort of ebb and flow into into each other, um, I, I loved that, and I wanted to try to do that, and it started working with a handful of songs, and then um, we had the song Shadow Shaker, which is the one directly after it, same key, and I, I just that just was luck that I was doing this kind of noise outro, and then you could hear the t -t 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 come in from the from the uh, that was the that was the 707 um sequence but oh, sure. yeah so like that was that was pure luck but then once you know that happened it was really cool to kind of watch everything else do because yeah. there's other parts on the record where that that happens as well oh yeah well it's little happy accidents like that and i and it's, oh yeah i mean it's it's something that i i like about larger projects um <laughs> like if you have like a you know like a five track ep or if you have like, you know, a 10 or 12 track album, mm -hmm. like you get more room to play than if you have a single. Like, do you do you prefer uh, like albums or do you prefer uh, just single tracks when you're when you're working at least? It, I prefer albums, but I also love the concept of singles. Um, because it's, we live in a, when singles were first starting, we, uh, we live in a different world musically now. So a single doesn't mean it's three and a half minutes long, right? Yeah. Like it doesn't have to be a perfectly linked single. So like, but having this, like the, the la when, when we did the last record, we'll probably do it similar with the first one. We released like a song at a time for a little bit. And there's oh, a video that sure. comes with it. And then when you actually hear the whole project and hear that it's all part of one thing, um, that to me is something that I, you know, like doing, but uh, yeah, I think that there's, there's, you can, you can do a lot with the album and you can do a lot with a single and you can do a lot separately that both complement each other. If that yeah. makes any sense. Cause like you, well, the stuff we would release as singles were, were cut as singles. They weren't, um, they were mastered as singles. Like there's no bleed and of other, other songs and stuff. So like they're just individual songs. Um, but I, I prefer, I prefer albums um, if it's if it ha if it's thought out. Depending, <laughs> depends on the band. I like that. Like, I like that. The, you, the, the producer or whatever. So you're not a. So it sounds like you're not as big on like a collection of songs. Like you you want a project, essentially. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like I think the and my hope is that where I am in my life as I'm writing and learning to make music, that they all find a similar world because of the fact that it's my, hopefully my, so I'm putting myself into it. So like when a collection of songs comes out, um, 
and then you watch them and you hear the themes and some of that is again happy accidents uh I, yeah I, I i'm i am not married to any um format how about that like i Fair love enough. i love to i love to mess with things I, I like to not i like to see things being used for things like way it shouldn't be used if that makes any sense no it makes so. total sense like i mean like like how the song kind of started in terms of not like the song itself but in terms of like the production process like just kind of accidentally stumbling upon like a blown out organ and, and yeah. having that turn into a whole basically a whole track yeah um so did you do the the mix and master on this or was this uh... no so i i'm one of the i'm one of those 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 people who don't i don't like to mix or master anything i do because i'm not good at it like i know my my strengths are not in that world um, totally i can get it to a listenable state like what you're going to hear the next the one in the working project the working process is definitely in a listenable state i did it but um, it's not good. Like, I don't even like <laughs> you know, don't crit- don't critique the mix. It's uh, you know, all my stuff is unmixed, unmastered. Of uh, course, of course. People. But um, no, so Gus, this guy named Gus Berry, who actually plays in the band now, um, he is he went to Berkeley, uh, studied um, engineering and mixing, and uh, he and I connected. We uh, I met his wife. My wife and his wife met, and then they were like, "Oh, you should get together with him." This that whole thing we we'd actually. Not, not a lot of people know this. We'd actually mixed that record once before. This was the second mix of the record. The first one we mixed uh, mixed over um, was fortunate enough to go to Wilco's loft and uh, to and their space to mix it with their engineer. And and I loved that record. I loved how it sounded and it was cool and it was great. But I, there was a lot of baggage that came with that record from that mix, like getting dropped from a label. Mm-hmm. Um, my son, when he was born, we had like this crazy health complication we were in the hospital for a couple of months oh, and so yeah. like i just needed like a fresh start on these songs and so I, gus was like well let me just let me just try to mix it and see what we can do and when he sent the first mix of the last track the last track sleeping giant we were both like oh, everyone in the band was like this is this is where it needs to go so he just took oh, over from there and then now we're like we're like he's playing in the band he, we're still good friends he's about to get all you know he'll get all of the stuff moving forward for mixing he's he's a really solid mixer that's awesome. Well, uh, the reason why I'm, I'm asking about that is for um, for a lot of people, like when I was in school, the way that we thought about mixing was like reverb and delay and a lot of the effects that are put onto a, a track come in during uh, the, the mixing process, at least for kind mm. of more acoustic based music. Um, were all these effects kind of, or the atmosphere, the environment, were these part of the production process or did uh, Gus add these in? Did I get that right? Gus, right? Yeah, Gus, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did he add those in during the mix? He added some of the, the finesse of like the ping pong stuff, right? Like the ping pong mm. stereo delays and stuff. Um, but all of that, I again I use like the effects to help me kind of write and okay. shape. And so yeah. like it is definitely it's more of uh using effects as to to inspire and, and produce than so, it is to like I know what I want to do, this, this, this. It's like if I can capture it in raw format, again, this whole goes back to the whole thing about video editing. Mm-hmm. If I can capture, 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 and then I can mess it up in a fun way and start messing with it. And and that's that to me is, you know that's part of the whole exploration of it but at the same time i would never mix it because I, you know i know i'm just now learning that mixing is not adding it's all subtracting frequencies yeah it's know? all removing the stuff that you don't want <laughs> is the key to a good mix um yeah. i dig it Ooh. thank you to madism for that three-month resub thank you so much i'm gonna let the voice say something damn three months already three whole months thank you so much madism i appreciate it buddy um sorry about that um, but I guess what I'm, what I'm kind of trying to steer towards with, with these last couple of questions is like, kind of what would you consider the delineation between kind of the three stages of the song? Like the, I would say from what you're describing, like the, the beginning part was kind of just you with the piano recording a demo, getting the vocals done. You had the idea for the song. That's step one. And that was pretty much done when you wrote that. And then Mm -hmm. step two was this big production process where you stayed up until 6 a.m., trying all these different ideas, editing it down, kind of creating all these different um, kind of sonic landscapes, as I call them, and crafting it into something that was pretty much done. And then Mm -hmm. the 
the last part was kind of almost like relinquishing control and giving it to someone else to do the final mix. Is right. that is that uh, yeah. accurate? That is very accurate, and that's and I actually I I prefer to work that way because it gives me a, a an end point for a song. Because I could, I, I am like, as we've we probably discussed a bunch, like, I like to wander, I like to explore. And so I can never, I could always tweak a song. I could always be like, well, maybe we should try this. Or I could never, you know, I could just go on and on and never. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I like the idea of a, a fresh set of ears bringing their perspective into it because mixing is very much an art um, as much as it is a science, uh, mm. understanding the right things. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I, I, it's, yeah, I've, and I have heard mixes that have saved songs, you know, where because I was like, this is a great song. I don't know if it's recorded well. And then they send it back and they're like, this is great. Like, I'm really happy with this now. Instead yeah. of like, oh, I don't know how this is going to go. <laughs> um, so I've heard mixes like, yeah, I believe in the in, that mixing is definitely another element of of, of the, the process. Um, yeah. So that, there's that. And mastering for me as well. There's a guy named Jim Domain in Nashville who has mastered pretty much the last few records of mine he's just solid and so great yeah finding people you know is important like people yeah. you can trust um, yeah yeah because you understand what you're going to get and you can also if you need to push them like gus kind of came from that nashville world and like I, the whole time i was like listen i want it to sound like it's coming from a cassette tape and his brain was like why and i'm like because like that's cool that's textures that's character yeah. and so he he we kind of fought back and forth on it and he finally did some of the kind of the, the grainier elements underneath it and now what does he use he uses a lot of cassette plugins <laughs> really yeah he loves that kind of stuff oh, now. so like that's funny so finding that kind of partnership where you can push a little bit and, and he and he had to push with me because i wanted the vocals even lower and uh and he had to oh. fight me on that one so you know, that that kind of was really a cool partnership with that. It's so. almost like it's almost like a creative uh, compromise, but in like a good way, uh, you know, yeah. where you're not you're not compromising on like something you find integral to the song. You um, you find compromises in what other people want to bring out of your work. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Because they'll see. I mean, how many times have you listened to a record or heard a song and been like, "Gosh, if they had only done this." maybe I think this could be a more interesting idea or something like that. And so, the, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I welcome that in a lot of ways um, when I'm working with, with a mixer. Um, and in the even if I work with a producer in the future, which I'm, you know, definitely not opposed to, I only do this mainly because I'm cheap and uh, would rather invest in myself often totally. than a lot of other people. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Re engineering is a necessity. is not necessarily a luxury item for me. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So that whole that process of bringing someone else in to help pull out maybe the things you don't hear that are there, I think, is a really cool collaboration in part. And so when when mixers are asking for points in, in a lot of this business sense of it, like I'm actually um, depending on how complicated the mix is, I'm, I'm actually for it because it's a part of the collaboration. It's part oh, of yeah. the process. I'm with that. Well, do you, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little, getting a little distracted by a uh, Madism in chat. Did you see what he was writing? <laughs> <laughs> he got all excited. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, what I'm, what I'm curious about now is like, are you, um, someone who, uh, looks for multiple versions of uh, like a project either in like, like I mean it's obviously there's like so many versions in the ideations uh, process right. but when you're approaching that final um, like 10 or 20 percent of like how do we narrow in on what it is to make this song complete do you feel like you have to be involved in that or do you just let Gus or whoever is kind of working on that stuff kind of have a bit more control and you just kind of uh, advise essentially I definitely advise in that situation mm -hmm. um, and mainly because uh, I don't believe songs are ever finished if that makes sense like even like when I'm looking right now like so let your heart hold fast like we have back the record version of that and now we have a different version of it with this duo thing that we're doing that's very uh, moody and slower paced. And um, it's just, yeah, so like songs evolve even when they're on a record. Like 
and I think Neil Young was a really great uh, like example of that. Like you can hear multiple versions of songs on same different records, the same song on different yeah, yeah, records. Yeah. And, you know, like this Rest Never Sleeps is this live record where he has like essentially this super like droney, fuzzed out version of a song, and then he has the acoustic version of it, and it's they're both equally beautiful and have their place. And so having songs that are, are quote unquote finished, I don't necessarily think I believe in, but I do believe that there is a place where they are pre presentable to the public. Oh <laughs> and yeah. Then, then watching it from there. So, but when it comes to mixing in that, that kind of world, I, um, yeah, I, I do. When you find someone you trust creatively in that world, I think it's important to, um, to continue to work with them because yeah. it, it can, it can be a really beautiful partnership. With that, would you ever go and do another version of Bathe in Sunlight? The song that we just yeah, sure. Awesome. I mean, right now I'm really still really happy with that one. It still kind of yeah. gives me the freedom to to make a lot of noise. Like the noise always changes every night to night. You know, however, I, whatever pedal I want to step on, um, <laughs> yeah. or you know, expression I want to throw into it. Yeah, so yeah, the noise yeah. always changes. But yeah, I, I would definitely do um i would i would explore a different version of that yeah totally um is there anything else that you wanted to point out about this track like any little cool tidbits that we might have missed anything you thought was really interesting or engaging while you were working on it um i think the this is and kind of this kind of goes back to the mixing element of it it's just sort of a, a thing when when i recorded all these things like the 808 kick and the taurus pedals and you know when i would mix it it was it didn't really it would i knew it sounded cool mm -hmm. but then when i sent it to mixing and then he sent it back with this just fat low end that really shook you that's when i realized like mixing not that's that's what i'm talking about with mixing where it's like you know i can clearly make something sound like it wants to be on a cassette with the cassette but when he can grab a hold of that and really push that understanding where that is that to me is because I was just thinking about that when I was listening to it. I was like, gosh, when that, when that 808 and the bass come in, it's like it's really fat. So boomy, <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. And so like that kind of stuff I think is really, really cool. And is, again, one of the reasons I take it out of, I, I relinquish the mix totally. to someone else. I get that. I get that. I mean, it's it's a it's just a really fun track. Um, like there's just so many little details uh, throughout it that really sound good. I love the vocal harmonies, by the way. Thank you. Like the vocals just, and I'm glad that Gus fought you on bringing the vocals <laughs> up because the vocals are just, they're so angelic, um, but they still have a lot of um, pain in the way that they're presenting the lyrics. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of, it, it goes back to kind of the story uh, of how the song got started and it really um, emblemizes uh, for me kind of how, um, that person must have felt when they were finally yeah. free because it's it is bittersweet because you're out but you just lost almost half your life to something right. you didn't do and even now in even now he is still fighting the state of alabama for any kind of like compensation yeah they haven't they haven't paid him for putting him in prison for so you know for 30 years uh and yeah so there's just a lot of things like his journey his fight is not over even though he's out of prison Mm -hmm. He's still dealing with the repercussions of that. He's not like he got out and was like, I'm okay now. I have a job and I have all these things. I mean, he's written a great book. And um, and the other one, the the Equal Justice Initiative, is a book called Just Mercy. Is the guy who, Brian Stevenson is the, the dude who started it. Mm -hmm. And they're making a movie with, uh, who is the dude? Who was um, in, uh, what's his name? He was in Fahrenheit 451, the remake. And then he was also in Michael Jordan. Oh. Michael B. Jordan. Michael he's B. Jordan, playing, not, not yeah, the basketball not, player. Not, 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 uh, not Air Jordan, uh, yeah. Michael B. Jordan, but he's, he's playing, they were doing a recreation, like a, the story of that book. Oh, that's awesome. Is, is, is him. But that kind of stuff is, yeah, it goes back to that whole idea of like, kind of in my whole world, actually, now I'm thinking about it, like nothing is ever really complete. Yeah. Well, I mean, with kind of state. <laughs> yeah. Well, with that, I think it's a good it's a good time to start to to pivot a little bit and check yeah, yeah. out your work in progress. Now, uh, this one for people uh, watching the stream, this one is not going to be uh, linkable, but uh, hopefully everyone will get a chance to hear it nice and cleanly. Um, yeah. You want to mute, and we'll uh, we'll go in on that. Awesome. So this one is called Summer's Ending. Whoops, I uh, accidentally forgot to uh, switch my audio on Discord. There we go. Hmm. 
Summer's ending, don't cry You had your own goodbye blue sky For you ask, I don't know I'm not scared of tomorrow Strange how some things stay the same While everything else changes On the landing. <laughs> that was dope. Oh, make sure. Thank you. Sorry, yeah, I was no, trying to find the mute button. The button was off. That was wonderful. Um, that was so thanks. good. Um, <clears throat> I remember this track. I actually remember you with the piano. Yes. Going I was going to say down. you were here when I found that. <laughs> yeah, that was so fun. Oh man, I love how, how this track has developed from the last time I heard it. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm really excited. I added the, I think I've added the guitar since the last time you heard it. Um, and I really wanted to go for this kind of classic country, old school, set, six, 50s and 60s guitar vibes, whether I think a lot of the classic country music and also some of like the, the Stax world, those kind of soul music, I think sometimes they would blend a lot. I mean, rhythm and blues, I guess, technically. Yeah. So I kind of was going for that kind of classic reverb, uh, tremolo, vibe so everything on that is all those things that that is all actually recorded live like the the reverb and the tremolo and stuff 
uh, for the electric guitars. But yeah, I, I think it's really kind of started to shape up to where it feels is feeling good. Those are those are un, those are not the final vocals. Those are scratch vocals, um, and uh, so there's going to be extra little elements and small details added to that. But I'm I'm excited with how that one's turned out. Yeah. What would you say is the the percentage if you could give it a a, a number or a range at least? Ooh, uh, as far as like uh, before mixing, I would probably put it at about eighty percent. Oh, for sure. Okay. There's yeah. I think there's more. Um, there's m- different guitar things to layer that I would like to do. I'd like to experiment with layering. I don't do that as much as um, I should. Mm-hmm. So I want to experiment more with some layering. Um, I do, the original demo of that one had um, a, uh, a hard right, hard left panned vocal, single, like main vocal, So, but they're each different takes. And so it felt like kind of Corsi, Elliot Smith kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I love that. And some Beatles as well, but like that kind of stuff is something I'd like to explore on it too. So as far as, if it's done, maybe it's done. I don't know, but like I'm, I still have a lot of exploring to do. With that it. one, you still want to play so, with it. I get. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's still some some really cool. Like there's more juice to squeeze out of it. Yeah, in my the, opinion. the choir actually is something that I think was not in the last version I heard. Where did that come from? That's uh, that's uh, the G Force Mellotron samples. That's a Mellotron. That's yeah, so it's a cool. Mellotron running through. <laughs> ton of reverb yeah. do you have like, the do you have the project open or can we take a look at it yeah yeah let's see hang on uh let me pull it up make sure i have this open just in case uh, where are you decapitator fm so the the uh, don't have that i can pull it up though it's easy to get yeah and then you should just be able to click up. the share uh icon at the bottom of the zoom window and that can okay pop us over Whoops. Um, so while you're getting that started, I don't want to make you multitask too much, but um, could you talk a little bit about how this song got started? Like, is it similar to the last one where the song itself was written and then the production was done and then later will come the mixing? Yeah. So this one was um, I, I'm kind of evolving a little bit more in how I write and using more of the studio again. So this was the first uh, song I'd written with where I kind of wrote all of the parts. Um, let's see, where's the share screen button? Here. Uh, okay. I have two screens. Which one do you want to see? Let's do this. Let's do the mix one. Right. Let's see options. Uh, yeah, okay. We'll do this one. Works perfect. Um, tell me if this is working. Yeah, it's working great. Okay. So this is, yeah, this is our, um, this is our Mellotron samples right here. Uh, but yeah, I, there's nothing coming through at the moment. Um, so this uh, this was the first song I'd written where I was like, okay, I'm gonna build the drums, kind of the idea of the drums. What do I think? Um, what do I, and the bass and kind of like play with it, um, more of a writing process. But then what you heard that when we brought the other guys in, like some of it was, the drums are totally different. The drums have this kind of radio head. Uh, there's a song from Amnesiac. I think those, those, those drums feel like, and then, um, the bass, he is much, much, much better bass player than me. So like, he kind of added a little, I get the foundations and he added to it. So it was fun to write like that, um, that whole idea. But so this is one of the first songs I've written as like kind of me exploring the full thing and, and having the full picture, which has been, which is really fun for me. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Here's the Mellotron samples. I don't think I have anything loaded, um, but they have all of them. They have tons of different tapes. Um, and the uh, Chamberlain Choir. Here it is. Uh, I don't remember which one it was. Legitimately think I just. And you can like run it through just a ton of their like their deal delay. Oh, for sure. I don't think we can hear it quite. You oh, okay. Might have to, you Let's might see. have to enable computer audio inside yeah, of that. Sorry. Yeah, share it by application window and not d- display. I mean, it, it should work, Tachyon. I think there's uh, something to enable in the, um, like if you click the little microphone inside of. Um, uh, ah, here we go. Yeah. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Oh man, let's see. This makes me really sad. Have you guys been hearing my crappy webcam audio the whole time? I think, that, <laughs> I think that was, yes, you just got way closer to us. <laughs> Oh man! Oh, goodness, it's all good. Well, the second half will be uh, will be much cleaner audio, but I think people heard you just fine. Cool, good. I can so yeah, here's now, yeah. like this is the. Uh, I, uh, can you hear that now? Yeah, that's a, it's a bit okay. loud. I think we might want to turn it down a smidgen. There we go. Yeah. 
but this is cool because they have a bunch of different um so many different mixed they have like mixed tapes they have mixed like the all the whole this was the, the you know this is the first sampler the the mellotron yeah. so there's like so many cool um let's see where the, the the organ stuff the orchestra stuff is really cool they have like the black sabbath one where they pitched it down a bunch um but yeah so that 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 choir is just is just the um just the mellotron run through some reverb i believe that's awesome um but yeah uh, we were we were talking originally about how the the track got started and stuff like that um actually you know what hang on a second let's listen to this i don't know if there's any reverb i don't think there's any reverb on it there we go let's see here i'm going to isolate it real quick let me turn it down i don't want to blow your ears out Oh, you know what it is? Okay. That's pretty pretty much it actually. There's not much <laughs> reverb on it. Maybe some from the like just the kind of the the full bus uh reverb kind of the mm-hmm. glue things together. But yeah, that's pretty pretty simple. <laughs> so yeah, it's just some a little a little element underneath that I love. Yeah. So you said you said you work in Ableton, um, but we see Pro Tools on screen. Right. So, uh, does the the songwriting session come in Ableton, and then the tracking moves over to Pro Tools? Yes, that's exactly it. So everything uh, becomes Ableton is open more than Pro Tools on, in my world uh, for writing and creating, and uh, and then also, um, but when it comes to anything sequencing wise, programming wise, like drums or anything, I do not use. I can't use Pro Tools for that. It's terrible. And so I use Ableton and just feed it in through like rewire essentially. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to to do a lot of that stuff because I can't. Just Ableton is so much better about performance and programming than 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 Pro Tools. But and but I think Pro Tools is way better like editing and tracking and comping and just it's just they both have I think beautiful elements to each of them. But mm. I definitely am. A, I definitely use Pro Tools to track and Ableton to write and sequence. For sure. Um, so, uh, just kind of going through again, like the like the different motions. Like, where did the the songwriting start for this? Um, was it similar to the last track where you were kind of just you and a at a guitar or you and a piano? You were saying like you're trying to involve the studio more in your actual songwriting process. So, were you writing it like here and just kind of experimenting while you were getting the lyrics out and everything? Yeah, so this was this started with um, the guitar parts were done on what's uh, like a Princeton reverb, like a Fender Princeton that I had just gotten, uh, and and I love that I love when you get a new piece of gear and how it inspires you um, to to create something. So this was, um, yeah. So I used that. That was when I first got it. I kind of just started playing with the tremolo and loved the tremolo sound on just through the amp and realized like that would be a really cool kind of moment. And so I started working with that and then. I brought in like an acoustic guitar, just some pattern and rhythm. And then it kind of built around that, right? Kind of, it, it built at the same time. That was, again, that was one of the first times that's ever really, you know, I didn't have lyrics. I didn't have much done. This was more of the, I just sort of went for it and pieced things together. And oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it's ex- ex- explored more in the writing than the production. That that's, makes sense. That's, I mean, yeah, it's cool because it's, it's a departure. Like it's a yeah. it's a new direction. Um, what did it feel like to to kind of leave the lyrics for uh, later on in the songwriting process? It felt it felt great actually. <laughs> <laughs> lyrics are such a weird thing for me because sometimes I think my lyrics are so bad. I think they're really cheesy or not cool enough or whatever. Uh, and then sometimes I don't worry, I don't care as much, but. I put a lot of, I put a lot of emphasis on lyrics um, just because I like to explain with words as much as I can as, as, as well as music. Um, yeah. And so I put a lot of emphasis on there and some people probably don't even care. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> there was one time, I mean, we, honestly, when uh, it was like a year or two after it was like a year after we released the record and our bass player came in and he was like, you're not saying this on, you're actually saying this. And I'm like, yeah, because the whole time I thought you were just saying something else. else. And so it's like, <laughs> Again, no one cares except me. Oh yeah, I mean, well, you're <laughs> the I one writing the words. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
I've seen you in the studio with a big old uh, legal pad and a mm-hmm. pen. Um, was this one of those situations where like you kind of had the song playing and then you picked up the pen and pad and just started writing, or did the words kind of come more organically, for lack of a better uh, word? Yeah, no. For this one, the idea started, the vibe of the song started, and I let that influence the lyrics. Um, and and because in the past it's always been pretty much the other way around, like the lyrics and the found, the song kind of influenced the production. And so this was one where the vibe, the the feel of everything helped me uh, kind of write towards the the idea of change um, and how uh, some things change, some things don't change. Uh, and those are the, you know, and we should welcome both of those things, I think yeah. is essentially it. Like when summer's ending, a lot of people are super sad about that, but I'm, fall is my favorite season. So like, this is the idea of like, there's things that are going to change our seasons of life. And I thought that the, 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 the music really kind of gave kind of a somber like conversation that you're having with a good friend who's like encouraging you to keep going kind of like there was like a a seriousness to it that um, I thought would fit well with this theme. Uh, So those two things sort of, yeah, the song, the music influenced the song, the writing on this one. For sure. Well, I mean like kind of uh, bunny hopping off of like the idea of, you know, seasons changing and things kind of moving and progressing in a positive way. Like, what was the first demo of this in comparison to what we're hearing right now? Like, what, what are the differences? Um, I don't know. I might actually be able to pull it up. Uh, let's see. It, so it's very stripped down. I mean, it's just like a simple drum loop uh, samples. So like, I think it was like even like Steven Slate stuff, which I've since discovered are not great samples. <laughs> I don't think they're great samples, personally. Yeah. If you want good drum samples, go to that sound. I want that sound. Those guys make killer drum samples. Oh, for sure. Um, uh, no, that's not it. Here it is. Let's see. I don't know if we're going to be able to, uh, if you'll be able to see this or not, hear it. But Let's see. Is this coming through? Yes. Okay, so there's, that's the Prophet transistor organ. I think this has the stereo vocals. Okay. Summer's ending, don't cry. Clouds are coming, goodbye, So you can hear it's a very similar idea, but in my opinion, when I started working with that, I realized I thought it was too close to bathe in sunlight. Uh, and so what I wanted to do was, you know, uh, approach it differently. And that's where the uh, that's where the DX7 FM8 stuff FM synths came in from the beginning. Um, let's see if we can get to some of the other stuff. Let's see. So it's- Yeah, this is like some of the lyrics have changed. Um, and this feels more like a band playing it live, in my opinion, where what yeah. I've been doing with it is really exploring more sounds. So. Thank you. 
Is that bass live? Oh, I hear a vocoder. Yeah, so that's that's essentially kind of where where I ended up before we went to tracking. And so that in my like you can hear that the, the song structure hasn't really changed. Yeah. Um, it's still very much the same. Some guitar parts have, some lyrics have totally changed. Um, but there's it just feels more like um it just feels like a band playing it as the way it came across. But now um uh, it's I haven't been able, you know, I didn't add all the fun crystallizer and piano stuff and you know things like that so yeah so what would you say was your process in getting from what we just heard to the demo that you sent me like what what kind of steps because we talked about a little bit about some of them and the choir and the piano changing the, the vocals um but like one thing i noticed in this that i don't think i heard in the current iteration was it sounded like in that last section there was a vocoder on the vocals or a vocoded layer to the vocals um, that was that. uh that was just a double so those were just like chorusy kind oh, of things for yeah sure for sure there's no vocoder in there i've tried so hard to put vocoder in something of mine that just never has worked it doesn't quite fit <laughs> i get that um but yeah there's that was just a lot of yeah essentially that was just layering um uh yeah I love vocoder though. Gosh, <laughs> I dig it. Uh, well, are there any um, any little things you want to show us in the project, either in the uh, arrangement or here in the in the mix review? Um, let's see. Yeah, so I think some of the fun stuff here. I'll move because uh, I think. Do you guys have the this this this, this showing up now? Yeah. Okay. Do, are two screens showing up or just one screen? Just I'm on a dual monitor. Okay, just, just one. Right um, so uh, what you'll see here is uh, I am not one of these people who is afraid to edit drums, um, but my philosophy on editing drums um, when they're organic is to not make them perfect, just make them work with the bass, which is up here. These two generally are when I'm editing and kind of comping. These two live together, uh, and then I want to make sure that they play well together that's all uh if if it's if it is if there is a sequence to it like a like a, any kind of like arpeggiator sequence or a drum machine I, I edit a little bit harder a little bit tighter but um i just sort of kind of move chunks around to kind of continue to give it that humanity mm -hmm. um let's see if there's oh this one was really cool this is actually something that underneath the guitar part um let's see, let's see. Oh, underneath the guitar part this is um a nord with their kind of built-in overdrive so uh let's see oops sorry melotron's still going no, it's all good so i i accidentally did that again this is another happy accident and then um where's the electric guitar part right here so like when you listen to them together <laughs> So there's almost this underneath layer of fuzz and, and you can't, it doesn't really like shine through. It's not in the front of it, but these small details I think are what's really interesting about making, just recording music and producing it and all that stuff. Um, so like that kind of thing, uh, those are things that I love. Uh, but yeah, everything on this song is pretty, this is actually the original um, take. Uh, oops. I think this is it, yeah. So this is just the demo track of the of the guitar that when I was kind of building everything. This was actually no, I'm taking this back. We tracked this live. So I built I built the song, um, and then we came in and we tracked this live. And this is actually the drums, uh, the guitar from that moment. Uh, and I didn't, I moved them a little bit because they were not working 100% tight wise rhythm wise. But I'd still I moved them because I wanted to kind of keep that feel to it. Um, 
So I may add more to that, but yeah, this one, this was a really cool, this was a fun song for me. The big thing for me that, um, let me move this back here. Cause there was, uh, this section, this, this is very, um, and uh, I think you were here when I found this stuff out, but like, this is the, uh, this is the thing that I just love about it where it's like, it's just a simple look. It's just a, just a simple little piano part, but it's running through a crystallizer into it's into the little play and into an echo boy. Like these, these are the things that like underneath, I mean, it's just, if you mute all that, it's just a, that's it, you know? <laughs> but then if you, you know, when you throw all that stuff back onto it, it really just kind of gives it a, 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 a world of its own. Yeah. It's very atmospheric. So that that stuff, those are things that I really enjoy, and 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 I think you may have told me this that like the sound toys guys, like the people who do Crystallizer and um, and Echo Boy and Little Play, Decapitator. I think you've said a lot of those are used in in a lot of electronic production. Oh yeah, in production. They're they're really yeah. I mean, I know a lot of people who make like electronic music who use those. Like the the they're more common in people who kind of like bridge the gap, kind of like you are in, in this project because they're they're very much like analog emulations pushed to the next level. Like they do a lot of stuff that's meant to sound like you're getting a lot of analog hardware outboard gear, but kind of expanding a lot of the functionality under the hood to kind of give you even more kind of uh, precise control over it. Right, right, right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I I personally, I love all of the the Sound Toys products. I use them all the time. Uh, They have... um yeah, I'm really, really glad that I, I got those. <laughs> they were, uh, I think I found them on like a special and I was like, this is, I was, let's see, I've, you know, people love, had told me about them before, but um, yeah, those are things. Sorry, my wife is telling me that she needs oh. to go. And so I'm telling her to send our son out here. <laughs> oh, for sure. Do you want to uh, start wrapping this up? I don't know how much time you have left. Yeah, no, we can definitely wrap it up unless he's, if yeah, and we can start wrapping up, but at the same time, he can come out here and hang out with us. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. No, I'm fine with that. Asleep. Let me go grab the monitor real quick and then we can keep going. Okay. Hang on. I'll be right back. Sorry, Sounds guys. good. No worries. I will try to uh, keep things going while we wait. There we go. Let me do that. How's everyone doing? Um, there's more character in the camera. I agree with that, uh, Tachyon. Like this, the, the way that this song has developed... Um, and I apologize for a lot of the audio issues uh, in the past couple of seconds. I've been trying to kind of make sure that the uh, the sound doesn't get too loud or too quiet um, for the recording. But, um, yeah, I feel like from what we've seen and what we've heard, like, for me at least, it shows that you don't necessarily need to worry a ton about, like, um, you know, getting the song perfect in the first session, even if you get it like almost done, like there's so much more you can add to the song and to the process um, in terms of like, uh, you know, additional effects or additional sounds. And I feel like uh, if you aren't so concerned with, um, you know, perfecting the song in the first session, you have, I feel like you have like a lot more fun. Um, Sorry, I was just trying to, to, keep the the air from being dead while you were while you're out yeah. no worries no worries i have the monitor he's asleep and he you can until he wakes up we're good to go okay perfect <laughs> um, i need to get him within the hour after he wakes up right i think that's the rules to being a parent <laughs> yeah well we can well we can kind of uh kind of just speed through uh these last couple of questions if he wants oh, to come sure. in and say hello more than happy to do that um, so I guess the, the, the last two questions I had, um, for, for this project are one, like, what would you say, uh, is left in terms of getting this finished, not just in terms of like, uh, the production, but also in terms of the mix and the master, are there any goals that you have for it or any ideas you have in mind for kind of the, the, the setting of the song? And then are there any, um more little tidbits or tricks or anything that you had in this project that you wanted to show off before we kind of move towards the last little bit of this? Um, this is a pretty standard, um, it's a pretty standard song for me. There is one thing that this is something that I, I was actually, uh, found really interesting. And, and, um, 
let me find it over here. Uh, let's see, there we go. The this is the this so this is the um, FM eight plugin. Um, oh, we can't quite from, see it. Oh, there's a bit of an issue with the screen, and only look at stream and see what's going on. I don't know. We got a big a big white line. Um, uh oh. Let's see. Well, I think this is all Sonic anyway. It doesn't matter. So yeah. I'll just kind of keep talking about it. And uh, yeah. this is so this is just an FM eight synth. Um, mm. And what I loved about this was that when it kicks in later in the song, when everything else comes in, so like at this point right here, when the, or the acoustics come in. While everything else changed. The thing that, the thing that, I, that, drew me to how simple this is it reminded me somehow it has the texture of a pedal still guitar uh it really sits in the mix like a pedal still uh even though it's absolutely an fm synth like you know so it's like that, those are the things that i think are are super cool um about watching finding the 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 happy world between organic and digital um and you depending on who you talk to like you know i'm i'm a big fan of of, of, of that a lot of people aren't some people are very hardcore like only the tape um but artists are creatures of necessity what we have we're going to use we're going to find a way to make it work and so these are the things that i think are uh pretty cool this is a pretty standard for me though this is a pretty like uh standard production for me mm -hmm. um there are other ones that are a little bit more in detail but they're not in listenable yeah. formats at the okay. moment so yeah well, uh, uh, do you want to hop I'll stop yeah, that go. that way? Yeah, Maybe so the, I'm not covering the, up your face back. real quick. There we go. All righty. Um, let me get this set back up. Perfect. Um, cool. Uh, I mean, I, I love it. I'm looking forward to seeing what it sounds like when Thank it's you. done. Um, so I guess the, the way that we can end this um, is uh, kind of going over what we talked about for these two songs, but in a more kind of abstract um, way or more like a hypothetical way. So uh, when you're starting a song, um, what do you usually start with? Um, and how far do you usually get in kind of the songwriting process before you're done with that initial session? Um, ooh. Great question. <laughs> and so it kind of changes. I would say more often than not when it comes to writing. Um, oh, you guys are probably hearing like the Discord beeps, aren't you? Maybe. No Sorry. comment. Okay. Um, I'm just going to show you that. The, so the, more often than not, it starts with a singular instrument. Um, it starts with a guitar or a piano. Uh, but, uh, and 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 because the reason I do that is because, and this harkens back to my whole like songwriter days, I think that it's very important to be able to, in what I'm doing, be able to just play the song by itself, right? It's a different world for, for different kinds of genres of music. It's like, that's not like, that's not a knock on any other kind of genre. That's me just saying like, um, you know, I want to be able to perform this with a guitar if I want to, just by myself. So th that's pretty much the, the the basis which most songs start with is a foundation. Now, that being said, there are definitely times where I'm on the Prophet or on the Moog or exploring a sound, just hearing something and be like, oh, dude, that sounds amazing. And then you kind of find something to, to, to a place to fit that. Does that make sense? Is that does it that does. answer the question? Yeah, really no, well, it does. That... It, no, it works. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, Tachyon had a, an additional follow-up question that kind of connects with that. If you wanted to address that. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's see. Generally, start with chords. Um, so yeah, you know, ooh, I am never a melody person first. I'm always a music person first. Um, and I I do often try to let that dictate the the song more. Because like I said, if you can write the music, um, like even just with the, even just with a piano or just a guitar, if that alone can speak to your emotions, then, and then you let that influence your words and what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I think to me that that is uh, a really nice compliment to just 
making music. So for you, the melody is almost tied to the lyrics. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah, when, I, when I'm writing the lyrics, I'm writing the melody okay. to the song. So like, and I'm and sometimes it's just gibberish to because I like the melody, and sometimes it's wordplay. Uh, and sometimes I land on exactly what I'm going to say. Um, but a lot of the times that, yeah, the m- lyrics and melody are written at the, in unison at the same time. Yeah. We, we've had one other, uh, singer songwriter, uh, on the, uh, the interview series. And, and she said the same exact thing. Her name is a uh, copper queen sage. Uh, she's, she's a, another wonderful, wonderful streamer. Let me give her a quick shout out. Uh, there we go. Um, and she, uh, she said that like she can't really write melodies independent of the lyrics, and she writes them all kind of on top of the the music, essentially, kind of like you're you're talking about. And I'm I'm curious if that's something that you notice from other songwriters. Like, is it the sort of thing where like the you get the the harmonic bed, you get the world that the uh, the mm-hmm. lyrics and the melodies come in, and then what you're saying kind of comes forth from that process yes that that is that is a good way to put it like uh, and i think that i'm trying to figure out where that came from now that i think about it like i think that just found that was the best way for me to to write and what and i know that part of that philosophy behind just the music alone came from um from cigaros because i don't know what that dude's saying okay like is speaking icelandic and one record even like makes up his own language right so like i have no idea like what he's saying or what he's singing but the music was so powerful at moments uh on the record talk t-a-k-k like i just it just i just remember thinking this was so i don't care what he's singing i don't care he didn't even have to sing and so like that to me was kind of that was early 2000s Mm-hmm. for me so that was like okay this is very very much the direction i want to write now because up until then i had been like oh i want to write a song like this writer or this writer and that's i think a very necessary part process of learning to write and find your voice um i still always am writing like like other people but then eventually it starts it, it, it diverges from what they you know it's not iteration yeah. of that but anyway well, the, the um, more you fail yeah, so like that, that definitely the thing is the music comes first the motion from the music dictates how the song the, the lyrics go um occasionally i will try to to mess with that formula to see if what it sounds like to put a make a happy sad song mm-hmm. or a sad happy song um but yeah that's definitely the the the, the direction I, I generally take in writing okay for sure well uh tachyon kind of has a little follow-up do you start oh. with like more simple chords do you go towards anything more jazzy with more complex kind of harmonic information or I start with very basic chords. Uh, everything is built off of the Towns Van Sant songwriter from Texas, the four chords and the truth. Like that's kind of the, 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 the foundation of everything. Um, and then after that, those, yeah, that's exactly it. So it's just, just simple chords. Uh, I'm not a great like keys player. I can play a little bit, but I, you know, it's very simple melodies and kind of rolls on the piano. If I'm doing that or the guitar, it's very much, things in C with a capo. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> totally. The C chord family with a capo. <laughs> I get that. I mean, nothing wrong with that. Like, I think, um, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, artists, especially in the more electronic realm, uh, people who kind of move into more hybrid styles, like, we tend to focus a lot on color and mm. on timbre. And, uh, like, as someone who kind of exists in uh, sometimes a more kind of theoretical space, not necessarily in my writing, but in kind of how I kind of dive into music as a process. Um, Like, I definitely find myself leaning more towards things that have uh, richer harmonies or more complex textures. But I think it can also, uh, and I'm not saying this is true for anyone in chat more so than it is for, for me probably, um, but like sometimes it can be a crutch. Hmm. Like if you can make a good song that just uses that pop progression, you know, you're you're in a really good spot, I feel like, because that means that you are taking something like tried and true potentially even you know beaten into the ground Mm -hmm. and you're finding something that still speaks to at the very least yourself if not other people um what do you think about that i think that's i think that's um 
I think that's, yeah, that's true. I think there's, I, I, I think it comes down to, I, I, I think that every genre has their crutch that you're kind of talking about where, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's, um, uh, in, in my opinion, Nashville, like whenever you have people there, like the, they're generally very clever lyrics and very, um, very wonderfully engineered and recorded and mixed so- sounds. Right. And I think that works great for, for, for that world. Um, I think sometimes people rely too much on that, the engineering and the studio process versus the writing. Um, but I think at the same time, like I've certainly written songs that I think I've recorded very poorly and probably should do another take at, uh, now that I'm a little bit more experienced. Um, but I th- th- think that's, you know, everyone has their crutch. And, and for me, I think, I don't know what, yeah, I, I didn't know what it was for, for, for the dance music world, for the electronic music. Like, is it just, you know, was it that bass that the, the, um, the dub bass, that dubstep bass that everyone was doing the wobbles, and whatnot, yeah. like, which I explored. I love that sound. I love how they're just messing with things like that. But so like, was that one of theirs? I don't know. But I think every, every genre has their crutch. Has a crutch. I think that's a really good point. Um, that, like the the style that you write in does in essence dictate a lot of your musical decisions even on a subconscious level Mm -hmm. um so i think you know that's that's for me that's what makes kind of fusing ideas together the most fun like being able to figure out like you know what are the tropes almost what are the you know the the tv tropes.com list of, of of almost like farcical little uh joke ideas that represent yeah. this uh concept uh, whether it's you know folk or whether it's dubstep or whether it's drum and bass or whether it's you know uh, hip-hop and then what happens when I try and mash that into something that has a completely different style? <laughs> what will actually carry over that they can work well together? And what in those two ideas am I forced to discard? Right. And that's yeah. always been real yeah. fun. I was thinking about that when, when you were saying that, like the, the, uh, if I hear another, uh, another, <laughs> whoever, if anyone's listening, whatever, if, uh, sorry about this, if this offends you, probably it won't. But if I hear another stomp clap folk song where people are saying like, Hey, no, and all that kind of stuff, like I'm going to punch someone. But at the same time, when I hear a folk song with just a kick, like as the four on the floor kick, yeah. it reminds me of dance music to be perfectly honest. Right. It's just like a simple foundation that for the song to exist on. Um, and so sometimes that, that, that trope, that, that crutch that you lean on when you're writing um, can be explored in a different genre. Like you were saying, I think that's really, totally. that, yeah, I've never really put that together. That, that four on the floor Munford and Sons thing, that is straight up a, like, I mean, a it's, like you know, it's not sequenced, but it's straight up a 808, like, or yeah. like a 909, just kept thumping, you know, like, anyway, that's, that's cool. Power. Uh, he makes postmodern folk reggaeton dubstep. <laughs> that that's is very, nice. um, sure. I'm into it. Go for it. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, the, the next question would be, what is the middle process? You know, how do you take that initial idea and develop it? Maybe not into like a finished song, maybe right. not into something that's like, you know, you're ready to have it sent off to be mixed and mastered, but like something that like you could send a demo off to the rest of the band, maybe play it for your wife, maybe play it for some of your friends and kind of just get some ideas. Like what is that process? So that process is um, generally uh, that's when I'll open up. That's when I start opening up pro tools at that point okay. um, to start tracking very simple ideas. Just the, the, the little idea and then from there and and some of the songs i send to the band and some of them i think you know i kind of hoard for myself going this is the one i want to work on this one like this is mine um not that i don't think their input is worth you know is worthless but uh just i feel connected to some of the songs a little you have more. your pet project um, i get that and so like they yeah so like i'll send it to them like kind of a rough idea and then they'll come back and say oh man that'd be really cool if we tried this or or what would it sound like this and they'll send links to Oh, listen to these drums. Something like this could be really cool. Um, so, in in some ways, it becomes collaborative at that point. Uh, and then, in some ways, like I said, I, I kind of hoard a few for, for me, just a a playground for me to play in. But that process is, um, and then it comes to we'll uh, we'll set up in here. This is uh, this is what I always call this the house that Barney Stinson built um, from How I Met Your Mother. Yeah. This is a, a converted garage that I feel very fortunate to have. Um, and we come in here and we mic up everything and then we just start tracking ideas and demos and we'll um and we're 
actually moving into the point where the 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 demo process, the writing, like where we're tracking, is actually starting to sound really like, like the the actually like tracking the record. Oh, so like, for sure. it's kind of becoming this um, the 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 demo, the I the theory of artists only falling in love with their demos and thinking these are the better versions of the songs is very true for me in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> And so we're trying to grab that. We're trying to capture yeah. that and be like, you know, and if it's not, we'll just redo it. You do know, it, we can just do it again. It's digital. Totally. It's not tape. <laughs> that's, that's a big thing. Like, it's kind of, I feel as though um, a lot of people who struggle um, when it comes to this part of it. And after this, I do kind of want to go back and go through these whole things in terms of like getting over writer's block. Because I'm curious yeah. kind of how you would address these different things. But I kind of want to go through your process before we get into that. Um, but I noticed that for a lot of people, it's they get tied down to like, you know, I need to make it here and now. But you don't always have to make, you know, uh, we will rock you in one night. You can take a couple of times, you can make a couple of shitty versions of it, and then eventually you'll land on the thing that is actually a hit, and you can really go in on that. Yeah, um, and I think a lot of that in the history, the, tr the, the, the past was actually done on the road for bands, right? They would, like, set up, and uh, and then they would immediately... Like, you know, their, their sound check was a rehearsal and a writing session or, and, you know, some, some people now even have like, like uh, uh, one of my friends plays trombone for, for Bon Iver. And uh, when he, when he gets to his space, someone has already set up essentially a mobile studio for him to kind of go work in. Oh, and so sure. like this, that process is happening on the road and it happened on the road in the past with bands where you're kind of exploring different things. Part of me thinks that streaming could in a way, um, not replace that, but be a compliment to that idea of trying different versions of songs uh, in, in front of people would be fine too. But I don't know. I just think that that streaming has a lot of opportunities to explore that thing, but you're right. Like Rome wasn't built in a day. We will rock you probably was, there's probably versions of that that are terrible out there. You know, <laughs> some people might think that the one is terrible now. I think it's overplayed. But it's great. <laughs> Uh, totally but that's the point yeah you're right like so the, the, the evolution of song of the process how you place things and do things that's that's the, that's part of the fun oh yeah well i mean kind of moving moving past that um real quick like once you have settled on a demo that's like this is the one this is the thing that we're going to finish what is that process like? Like how much work do you usually have to go through before it's like, okay, this is done. I'm going to send it off to Gus. He's going to mix it. I'm going to send it off to Nashville to get it mastered. We're ready. That process um, can take anywhere from uh, three days to years. <laughs> I, <feel like. laughs> I think it just Sounds depends right. on the, how the song, the puzzle falls in place. Like mm -hmm. essentially. Um, some of them, some of these, again, have been working on for, um, yeah, maybe like two or three years now, like some of the songs that we're trying to wrap up now and 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 some of them that won't make the record because I'm not going to be able to finish. I can't figure them out still. But in the meantime, there have been new songs that have come in and caught my ear and kind of done that. So that process really comes down to tracking, um, tracking drums, bass, and guitar. We try to do it live as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I will just do a scratch track and the drums and bass will play live. Those two, are, uh, we gen like those two I always want to play live. Um, because there is a there is a conversation happening happening a give and take between them, um, so that that process happens, and then after that, I'll take it and I'll edit it and um, kind of get it into a workable state, and then I'll start layering and adding and exploring. Um, uh, after that, at some point, I, when I hear something and I go, okay, there's too much going on, I'll pull it back a little bit, and that's when I know the song's ready to go to mixing. Oh, um, for sure. If it's too if it's too crowded. Um, I do like wall of sound stuff, but um, sometimes is, at some point you just go, this is unnecessary. Like this doesn't need this. It's not the right place. And it's not even going to be heard. So uh, that's when you kind of go, okay, maybe the song is in a, in a space to go for mixing. Um, yeah. 
Totally. Okay. I mean, it, hope that answers it. Yeah. No, it does. It does actually, and it's and it's funny that you mentioned that because I've been working on a on a track for a while now, and it's been kind of sitting on the back burner for about a month and a half at this point, and I was I was at like a plateau, like I couldn't find any way to advance the track, and then like just this past week, I opened it up and I was like, well, why don't I just mute this one big delay I have, this big delayed sound, it's kind of like going over the, the drop because this is a dance tune um, and all of a sudden the whole track sounded 10 million times better because I went in and I was like there's too much I've, I've hit that limit and being able to step back and remove this thing that was essentially just taking up you know space that could be filled by other more interesting things right. um, I was so attached to it because it was part of the original idea of when I was writing the song and being able to do that, like I'm more, I feel more confident that like this is an idea that I just need to maybe add like one or two more tiny little things and then just give it a mix down and it's done. Um, and I think it's a, it's a similar sort of process to what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's the, yeah, I think, and one thing that I, I think for me have, have realized over time is that I don't, I'm not, a, so since I'm not a mixer, I'm not mixing as I go to have the sounds. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I overcompensate by adding too much when oh, it yeah. could just be very much a drum space guitar, simple. It's all about character and vibe and recording and, and the mix itself can, can kind of it bring out the fullness of it. Right. And so like, oh, that's nice. something that I, I do keep in mind, knowing that mixing is again, that process that can be a really great extra step in the collaboration of, of making music so yeah. i completely understand what you're saying like where it's like sometimes there's just too much and all we really need is just a, a kick drum and a guitar just got a good and a hey and ho and a clap <laughs> yeah i mean uh, good songs have been made with less that's um, true man yeah i mean if you go back and listen to some of the beatles stuff it's very simple and also very out of tune and terrible <laughs> like yeah. some of their vocals are like horrible uh and it's great it's because it's all about character and capturing that emotion um, and they're also groundbreaking, but even if you go listen to like, um, let's see, uh, okay, well, no, I'm not going to say him, uh, Oasis. Let's talk about Oasis for a second. Like that band, if you ever try to play along with any of their records, you're not going to be able to, because they never tuned. They just tuned to one person in the band. And that guy was generally not near, like he might be close to being in tune. Um, but so like that's, that to me is, uh, that is kind of the essence of, um yeah i just i think that's the interesting thing about tracking and 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 making imperfection the right thing right like trying 1, not to trying trying to make something perfect is is a, is, a, is an endless void that you'll never be able to yeah. fill, Perf I perfection guess. is a pit absolutely um so uh i guess now is a good time to, to go back kind of through this whole thing one more time but from the perspective of someone who might be hitting a block mm -hmm. um, so for example like uh, how would you overcome writer's block with a blank canvas like how do you get over that initial hurdle of maybe you don't have any ideas coming forth maybe you're just a little bit intimidated by so many options mm -hmm. how do you get past that first step uh, there are two steps. I think there are two things for me that, that immediately come to mind. Um, one of them is uh, make sure you're taking care of yourself. Um, I know a lot of my mental, a lot of my um, writer's blocks generally can come from uh, the moments where I'm, you know, in the past where I was wrestling with like depression and things like that. So make sure you're taking care of yourself. Like make sure your, your, your tank is full. Um, uh, but then after that, I like to, um, not beat myself up over the fact that I'm, I'm in a writer's block. I like to, um, and use that time to, to, to take in different things. So like I went through a very deep German psychedelic noy, like early Brian, Eno stuff. Like I went through yeah. a deep dive for that. Right. And so like, I'm learning other different songs and so like how people are making music and, um, and, and also learning other people's songs, like learning how to play someone else's songs, I think is great for, for just sort of keeping the wheels going, you know, and that's one, again, one of the reasons I love Twitch is that I used to be very staunch, like, Oh no covers, blah, blah, blah. I'm an <laughs> artist. And then the more I'm like learning other people's songs, I'm like, Oh my gosh, they're brilliant. How they wrote that and how they did this. And I understand what this led to. So I think that's another, like uh, those two resources, like doing a deep dive into a genre or a period of time of music 
is really, really inspiring. Um, and I've, yeah. And then make sure you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. Those are, those are good places. Those are good places to start with that. Uh, I do, I do believe whenever you do have something going and you've hit a wall, um, there's, uh, there's, there's another thing that Brian Eno, Daniel Lawa, they, they had this card strategies, this card thing called oblique oh, strategies. Yeah, or, oblique well, strategies. was it oblique strategies? Yeah, I'm pretty uh, sure it's yeah, oblique, oblique strategies. strategies yeah. yeah, and so, and you can't find, I've, I've tried to find it, but essentially it's just all these questions, like, and some of them are not about music. Some of them are just take a step back, or some of them are change the key, do it a step higher, do, you know, and are, what would, what would this sound like with, you know, in a supermarket? Like these ideas that just sort of kind of get your brain going. That, and then I also believe in distraction, like the video games, like some sort of distraction, reading something, getting away from music as well. Yeah. So. Breaks are, breaks are important. Like that's, that's something that I think this trip for me at least was, was really, uh, useful in understanding. And also if you are curious, I did find a link to, uh, oblique strategies as like a, a little web idea. You just click oh. the thing and, and you just click the here for a new pick and just gives you a bunch of, uh, different little things. The most important thing is the thing most easily forgotten. Like that's like that, that's what I, that's how I feel about lyrics. Often, like 100%. I beat myself over lyrics, and then I'm the one that's only one. You know, I'm the only one that's really paying attention. Exactly. <laughs> I know that's not true, but like it no, means more still, to me than a lot of other people. Exactly, but it's still it's still important. But like yeah. with that, like finding the time to get away from your own head mm -hmm. is like super important. Like I have been in a huge writer's block for like the past two months. Um, and that's kind of why I have these questions about like writer's block yeah. for the different steps of the process. Cause you know, it might help me. And at the very least it will definitely help someone else who I know is going through it. Um, and I have been just grinding like on Twitch, on my own music, on other people's stuff for six, eight months almost. And it was really wearing me down and being able to take a weekend take a week off of just like no streaming no social media yeah. don't focus on anything but just like having fun like the past two days once i've finally gotten back into things i've been writing music like all day mm -hmm. and it feels good to be back in that um, yeah. so, you know, as much as you should be working through, uh, your blocks, you sh should also like know when to, uh, surrender. Cause it's not that you're losing the war. You're just giving up on this one battle and figuring out an attack plan for the next time you go in. Yeah. And, and we also live in such a, an immediate world that I think the frustration of writer's block is, um, more or less yeah the frustration of writer block i think sometimes is, is directly correlated to the immediacy of the world we live in right now 100 percent. hopefully we're kind of like expecting something to be done very soon and rarely in my opinion does that happen like maybe once twice a year i can write a song in an hour and i feel like it's done uh mm -hmm. but most of the other time I'm, I'm very much just chipping away at it and understanding like this is this is the process this is not something that uh you know it's going to be immediate so yeah i completely agree with you man i think that's just having a minute taking a step back shutting your phone down mm -hmm. it, it does wonders for your soul man it really <laughs> does honestly um but kind of speaking about chipping away at an idea like um i don't know if you've ever had to deal with this is something that's very common in like the dance music world is getting stuck in like this idea of the eight bar loop um, mm. where you have like a seed of an idea and you can tell there's something good there, but you just can't take this like foundation and develop it into um, like a finished idea. So like, what would your strategies be for like, maybe like, I don't know if you ever have to deal with the eight bar loop, but like at, maybe I like do, actually, it? believe it or not, okay. you should see my Ableton folder of full of eight bar loops that have never been developed. I mean, like those are yeah. regardless of genre, like there's, you kind of come up with one idea and you're like, man, this is cool. The way I, what I do is I don't throw them away. Um, I'm not afraid to leave one behind, but I keep it. And, and often and more often than not, I stumble onto it months later where I do something. I'm like, gosh, you know, it would be perfect. That thing I did three months ago that I couldn't find an answer for. And yeah. then sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But like, I think that to me is you're not, I'm not building. Um, I'm saving all these ideas and I, they're not they don't have to be their own thing. They can be they can come in and out of different songs and um, 
So I, that's one of the things of like, man, if you're not going to b- b- do it now, don't beat yourself up, save it and see if maybe later in life, later down the road, you'll find a way to use it for something else. Oh, yeah. um, there's a few songs on this record where like they are, they are parts of, of, of two or three different ideas that finally came together as one song. Kind of combine them together. Okay, yeah. for sure. So that's something I, you know, I, I don't delete anything that I write, whether it's on my iPhone or whether it's on Ableton or Pro Tools. Like, but you know, I just, I will move them off of my hard drive and put them somewhere like a storage folder later. But yeah. I think that's one of the things is it's hard to get to shake that sometimes, that, that eight bar loop. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's, yeah, I think that's really cool that that's not isolated just to, 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 to anyone, that's, honestly, that's, everyone has it, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, uh, sound comms, we'll get to your question in a second. Cause I do kind of want to, uh, once we're done with this last little bit, I, I guess since we're kind of already going a little bit over, I don't want to keep you from your, your child too much longer. Um, but, uh, I want to talk about, uh, sync and how to yeah. maybe get sync and find sync but before we get to that what about like the the final moments of the songwriting process where it's like you have something that's like 90 percent done or even 95 percent done but there's like that one thing or those two things that are really eluding you and you just don't know how to get the song to be finished Hmm. um what would you do to get to that would you maybe like just say this is done even if it's not what i want it to be and you're just gonna maybe not release it but just call it finished um or even release it or is there some sort of strategy that you have to kind of get yourself to that moment of yes this is done yes i can finish this um wow yeah i think there are moments where i realize a song is not finished and the the beauty of where we live right now in 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 history of of technology and music is that it doesn't have to be finished today and it means that you know just because uh maybe this is just going to be an ep maybe this is just going to be a single maybe this is you know so like if it's not now uh, I, I view art, I view music as my life's work. I don't view it as now. Like this is something that I will always, I'll always have something to build off of. So, uh, under, just having peace with the fact that, gosh, this doesn't have to be done now. Now, if I were a mixer or it's like a master or something like mastering and engineer, and like you know, a client was waiting for it, that's a different story. But as as an artist, like you know, it's it, the, we live in a digital napkin world, right? Where all the lyrics are written on napkins in the past. They're all written on notepads somewhere around. So like, yeah, uh, yeah. that to me, I think is uh, understand that like things are never, yeah, th- it could be an EP. It doesn't have to be a full length record and come back to it if you're not happy with it. Like you're not ready for it to, to, to release. Don't force it basically. Yeah, yeah. Don't it force like. it, man. Just let it, you know, move on to something else, you know, that, and sometimes that alone will clear up your mind to finish the next thing, you know, yeah. the last thing you were working on. Absolutely. Um, that's a, that's a good point, honestly. Um, and, honest, and the other thing is like, I have had, I can't tell you how many times, and this is kind of goes back to that whole like pen and paper thing. I have, um, I use like a, a, this, well, this guy, this is, I use this thing. This is my like planner idea place. Um, and I have written, I have woken up at three in the morning with a song, like a, the, the finishing piece of a song. Or I'm like, and I'll write it down because I can't go out to the studio anymore because I could be up in like three hours to take me to school. But like, that's yeah. like, I, that whole idea is like understanding like this is not, yeah, the immediacy of, of finishing a song is not as, as like sending a tweet, I think is the, is what I've had to learn. I like that, that analogy. Sense, you know? Yeah. You don't have to, I mean, it's especially because a song is much more than 140 or I guess 280 characters at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 280. <laughs> But I think that's a that's that's a great little thing to end uh, basically not maybe not the entire interview, but like this section on because I think it's a lot of what you've talked about today doesn't relate to the technical aspect of writing music, which I'm really excited about. Like it's all been just about like, you know, being a human being. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we can often forget that, you know, while we are producers or songwriters or instrumentalists or whatever, we're still people and we have to do people things to properly do all the art things. You know what I mean? 
No, we want to be, yeah, we want to be loved. We want to be known. We want to, you know, we want to know that, that other people who we think are like, there's this modern artist named Tom Sachs that I love. He's this in New York. He's really cool. Um, and just today on Instagram, he posted a picture of him and his daughter. And it's like those that's real life. He's a human being with a child. And I put him on this pedestal as an artist, but he's very much, he goes home and has to change, you know, dirty diapers and that kind of stuff. Like they're, <laughs> Everyone takes a dump every now and then, okay? That's, yeah. like, that's, just, that's just life. So, like, we're Absolutely. all human, and we need that kind of. We need each other, and we need that that validation of, of of feeling loved instead of validation of being loved for what we make. Yeah, and and I hate to to, to end the this wonderful uh, sentiment with a transition into literally getting uh, a, a attention and recognition for uh, doing what other people want you to do, but mm. let's 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 end this on a uh, just a little conversation, I guess, about you know getting signed or getting sync because as you saw uh you know um sound columns had a question about like where to send music in order to get deals either for record label deals or right. for sync to like a tv show or a movie or anything so uh, you know please take the floor because you definitely have more experience in this area than i do and i would say that in the uh and this is something that i think i've learned from from hip hop, from electronic music, is that nowadays in, in the band world, like that whole idea of like we're not going to sign you unless you've built your own thing, has not is is the same. Like that's like you know in the past it's like oh we can get a publicist and we can get you on TV we can do this and this and this. That's not the truth anymore for any genre of music. Now now it's you need to build your own world and then people will come to you with opportunities. Now when it comes to licensing. Um, Gosh, my experience with how I, that happened was purely, um, I gave a friend of mine in Nashville some demos and he sent that to friends who did licensing. So that was that human to human thing again that, mm -hmm. um, that I think is, is there. Uh, but there are people, you know, licensing companies that will work for, that, that definitely take submissions. And you just gotta be okay with hearing no, because no is not a personal attack on you. It's not that this is horrible and you're not a good person. Like it's just no for now and, or no, it's not a good fit. And that doesn't mean there isn't a good fit for you. So when it comes to that world, like don't be, you know, you're going to get way more no's than yeses. I can guarantee you that. And you're now given the amount of music and, and the immediacy, like you're going to get a lot more no's than yeses. If you oh, ever yeah. get a yes, you know, like, so like, and don't, don't think it's not you. It's it generally a lot of times it's just the business that is way too, saturated especially with licensing these days like the oh, my, yeah. that last record we did was awesome and the, this newest one we did it, it was great but it wasn't nearly as um as great licensing wise as the first one and i think a lot of that is because the market has become that area has become the secrets out like people know that's how you can get paid yeah uh, so in that world um the licensing space uh you know things it's it's just an example like there are things that would pay you know, $20,000, $40,000, you know, six years ago that now will pay ten, five to $10,000, oh, right? Yeah. Less, it seems like that's how, that's how that market has changed. Cause there's just so many uh, options. And so in that situation, I, I think, and I, I can't really necessarily speak to like the, the producer EDM world. Like I, that's hard for me to say like, Oh, you should hit these people. Cause like when it comes to like the, where I live, like in the world I live in, it's, it's very much still um, a relationship game. And I don't know if that, that might still be the same there, but um, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's probably the best thing is to just focus on making something great and focus on being a, and having friends, <laughs> like yeah. being a good person. Right. And like, was it Steve Martin said, be so good. They can't ignore you. Oh, that's a good one. I like yeah. that. I mean, honestly, there's, there's a lot of little good tidbits uh, in that. Like, cause the more people you build relationships with, um, the more um, you kind of both find a support structure and mm -hmm. develop a support structure for others. Um, mm -hmm. Where, you know, you have people um, who are... Um, like looking for like um, 
you know, just a friend. And then by doing that, they want to invest in you in return because you gave them that validation. You gave them that recognition. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think kind of sound columns, what you're... What you're asking for, I think, and, and please don't post the link sound columns. I appreciate what you're saying, but we're not doing feedback today. Uh, this is not a feedback stream. Um, this is this is this is for for um, this is not for uh, this is not for for your music. I'm sorry, but you don't you don't want me listening being like I I, I would listen to me like yeah I can't I don't know what to do with this. This is idiot. This is great. How's that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mizar has way better feedback for, for that stuff. Huh? I appreciate that. But, <laughs> but I guess the, the, the point is, you know, if you have um, a community that you can find, if you can have a community that you can even build, like, I mean, because you were talking about, like, you know, getting notices a lot about kind of having your own world that you can create. And, you know, I, I like the, the feel of dreams metaphor here. You know, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. It's very true. I mean, that's exactly, I mean, again, it's that Steve Martin thing. Be so good. They can't ignore you. Like, exactly. And, and what I think, what I, and this is something that I, I would, I don't want this to come across as mean, but I do want it to come across as very like serious. That one of my things for a long, long time was I kept thinking, if I get this, if I get this record deal, if I get a manager, if I get an agent, if I get this, 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 or whatever, then I'm going to be, this is great. I'm going to be moving up the ladder on my next step, my next step, my next step. I've had all of that. And you know what they say? Their first question is like, who do you know so we can get you on tour? It's not who they know. It's who do you know? Right. And so like, it doesn't matter, you know, all these things that you, that you, you, you hope would open doors for you often aren't, they often come back to your relationships and how you treat people and how, you know, you've cared for people and gave them a sofa to sleep on or, you know, let them borrow a guitar when they broke a string in the first song of their set. Like that, that's what it comes down to a lot of, a lot of ways. And, um, that, and even, yeah, all of that stuff, like you're, you're like, Oh, I've got an agent. I got a big paradigm agent. This is going to be great. Nothing happens. And this, and that's what I'm saying. Like, it's just yeah. build your thing and, and don't worry about the industry because it's, it changes every 20 minutes. Yeah. Like, well, it's, you know, if that's kind of the, what I what I think is the big thing, like it, it is never going to be something that you can necessarily rely on for a long time. You know, you have to essentially like carve your own lane and hope that at some point some aspect of the music industry moves into that lane. You're already there. So because you've been doing your own shit, they are just like, oh, well, this person's already ready. Let's just push <laughs> them up. And then in a couple of years, there's a really good chance that that style will fade. So you have an option to either stick to what you love, stick to what you know, mm-hmm. and kind of uh, rely on the people who you built a fan base um on top of and really respect those people most importantly like making sure that the people who helped you get to where you are when you get a success you shouldn't just like well i'm going to ignore them and i'm going to go make like you know whatever dance pop is is on the radio right now when you got famous for making like you know future bass or or any other kind of dance music genre or even like in rock like going and making like um uh i don't want to throw any shade but uh have you listened to the new single off of the new green day record that's coming out no i have not listened to green day since american idiot um and the reason i haven't is because i feel like it became too much too orchestral punk pop punk yeah Uh, too much too much what i loved was them these three friends like making dick and fart jokes in a room then playing punk songs like that to me felt way more real uh so after american idiot i kind of was like "Eh." yeah i don't i'm not saying they can't make something good now though i'm that's it was just that was kind of the end for me totally i mean I, i i will confess i've never been the biggest fan of green day um, I know disrespect to people who like them or like their discography. It's just they've never really personally spoken to me um, in terms of like their, their musical styling or their messaging, though I do respect kind of what they what they want to do and everything. Right. But like their newest record, uh, the single, like the leadoff single, it sounds kind of like, you know, every, you know, 
pop rock tune from the past 10 years where it's like, oh, 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 let's be really clean and pristine and just sing with choirs. And it's just, it doesn't feel like Green Day. Like, right. I, I, as someone who wasn't a fan of them, I miss the old Green Day. And I feel like, in a sense, like may, maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like they are trying to catch the wave rather than, you know, lead the wave um, yeah. or create the wave. And I feel as though, you know, if you can either pay respect to the people who are uh, going to for a specific sound or evolving in a way where you're following not the trend, but the direction the trend wants to go in, like either of those ways are are totally viable. Just don't get caught up in kind of what this whole thing is like the sync game because it feels like they're they're making a record for sync. You yeah, you make a record to sell hamburgers. Exactly. <laughs> like that's that, that <laughs> whole thing that goes under like, you know, like literally if you listen to it and then you play it while a Toyota commercial is playing or while like um a M&M's commercial is playing or an iPhone commercial is playing like it'll fit right in. And I don't know if that's what we want to be doing. Yeah. I think there's, uh, it's funny because when you say that, the first thing I think of is, um, the, the O's, the big, oh, the big, like, Oh, uh, like I've certainly used it, but I always have used them more in like the old school punk gang vocal way <laughs> where now they've completely gone to the Imagine Dragons perfection of O's and, 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 Drum, or whatever those Ooh's big, and and big marching drums are yeah. but yeah <laughs> that's funny that's interesting so i mean that's i think that hopefully that helps sound columns like don't don't stress too much about getting the sync mm -hmm. get the music and then if you make some friends and like maybe one of those friends know someone at a record label or maybe that friend has a cousin who works for Netflix or what have you like little things like that can lead to huge results so just make yeah. friends be a human being yeah enjoy what you do enjoy what you make and and go hang out with people yeah I, I feel like that's been kind of the the moral of this of this whole stream today is just like exist don't don't only exist in this digital space or in your own room like exist in the world because there's so much stuff out there that's and and it's 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 an endless it's an endless thing to try to fill that like and i've been certainly guilty of that whole idea of like this is going to open up doors for me this is going to open up for doors. this business move this sound this and this it really at the end of the day i'm so much more happy not with a record deal, not with a manager or an agent, making what I want to make here. Um, and understanding the fact that uh, a lot of musicians in the past have always had day jobs as well. Mm -hmm. Like I know it's more prevalent now, and I think that's just because there's more access to music, but like, you know, there's been poets and writers and songwriters there were one of them was a postman for like, that was his job. And then he would think about poetry in his head on the way while he was doing it. It, it really just comes down to the fact of, of, of uh, just chasing what you want to do. And that authenticity is contagious, not necessarily a great sample, you know, not a yeah. great eight bar loop. It's the authenticity that's in, in my opinion, that's, that's that's and that's I think at the end of the day what you might be saying about that Green Day thing it just feels so forced. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Very very forced. Um, that's who wrote the song "Please, Mr. Postman" by Georgia Dobbins. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, well, on that note, no, uh, let's uh, let's let's wrap this up. Uh, thank you so so much for doing yeah, absolutely. this. Absolutely, I appreciate you having me. This has been a great conversation because I, at the end of the day, I do believe all artists wrestle with some sort of the of the same question it just manifests itself differently for even in, within music but i love it i love these conversations yeah i had a blast and i and i want to do this stuff more in the future like i i'm thinking about starting up like a roundtable podcast for like songwriters right. and producers and i'd love for you to be a part of that if you're interested i'd love that um, i would i love and i love doing it here on twitch because i think this is a great place to when you're talking about that whole idea of when the maybe the industry will swing a specific way i think streaming is really important and 
I think it has more potential than a lot of people realize. Yeah, I, I've been seeing more and more people start posting like YouTube tutorials and start streaming on Twitch for music stuff. So I, I think, you know, if you're on this platform and you're you're showing people how you're making your beats, I think you're actually ahead of the curve. So don't don't lose faith. Yeah, um, just hang in there and have exactly. fun. Be, exactly. be a friend. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, just to, to kind of wrap this up, uh, last thing, no more questions after this, I promise. <laughs> um, we talked a little bit about what's happening uh, towards the end of the year, but what's happening in the future? What's what's next for Fort Atlantic or Jonathan Black? Um, you know, I think in the future, what I'd like to see happen is is to continue working when I've worked with video when I took that kind of a, a little bit of a break to work and just started working with video for fun I saw a lot of potential in um, the visual elements of music and whether that's visuals for live performances or the whole like the concept of a visual album I think is really interesting but I want to explore uh, providing context to music with visuals um, I think one of the things that I miss about when I was a kid growing up was like having the the well, that is cassettes and CDs and stuff and flipping through and understanding who did this and this and this and reading the lyrics and stuff. And there was context to it about who I was. And so I want to try to explain, find that context with visuals, whether it's streaming or vlogs or vis or anything like that. I think this, there's stories to tell. And I think that that context is important. So in the future, what I'm, what I'm hoping for is, is uh, a, a, my idea is to hopefully do like a single and that single is, has a video, music video, a lyric video, and a, a, and a story and song kind of idea. And yeah. just these things that kind of that, that really feed more of the importance of, of what we make because it feels, music feels really disposable at the time. And so, yeah. and I want to take a moment to like share what I made, not just hope for the best clicks, you know, most, most clicks. And like, I really want to give people some context. So that's something I'm exploring is how do I, give people context to what I'm making and, and, and in a creative and fun way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of the future. We'll definitely start working more on, uh, we'll do in some more shows. We're kind of doing little small like fly dates for things. And, but uh, yeah, I'm just enjoying where I am. Honestly, it's, it's hard. It's hard at times, but I, as a, I've never been happier in my life, to be honest. So. Awesome. That's great. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you streaming again. Do you have any idea about when, cause you see um, an idea. Probably but... I'm hoping tomorrow night I'll be able to do a secret little like hey. test stream with some of the visuals and stuff. I'll try to, I'll try to see if I can stop by um, going out of town this weekend, but I definitely want to catch that if I can. Yeah, I want to do it. We're leaving. I'm leaving next weekend to go to Charleston, to South Carolina, where we lived for a little bit. And uh, uh, I want to get one or two in before that, just so I can kind of go on vacation and and really kind of get a uh, just a second to breathe. Sweet. Because I've been I've been knee deep in Max, and I'm like my brain's fried. <laughs> I feel you. Well, thank you so much again. I appreciate it. Yeah, man, absolutely. I'm let you go. Say goodbye to everyone. Thank you all yeah, so much. Cheers, for everyone. Thanks by. for the questions and stuff. I'm waving to my computer screen. I'm waving to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but thanks, guys. I really do appreciate it, and uh, and and I'm just happy to to know you now. Yeah, you this know? is great. Thank I you can't so wait to come down to LA and have a beer with you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. You better hit me up. Absolutely, dude. For awesome. Sure. Well, take care. I'm gonna Bye. let you go now. Bye. See ya. Awesome. That does it for us today. Thank you so much, John, again, if you're watching on the stream uh, for doing that. Thank you to everyone who stopped by. Thank you to John Sherrill uh, for that follow a while back, uh, a couple hours ago, honestly. I'm pretty sure you were friends with John, so thank you again for that. Um, thank you again to me and Rarebred for that follow, or for that raid, <laughs> not for that follow, but I appreciate that, buddy. Thank you all to everyone who uh, hung out today. This was fun. Um, like I said, we're doing only one stream this week. We'll be back to not just the regular schedule next week. We will be streaming every single day. I'm going to be going back to five day a week streaming. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you better go subscribe to me on Twitch so you can check all those out. Um, this will be the end of the YouTube video. So uh, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much. Uh, please like, comment and subscribe. All that good Twitch or YouTube stuff, not Twitch stuff. Please follow me on Twitch. Please follow me on Twitter. All that social media stuff. Um...